The Shepherd of Hermas, Chapter 1, The First Vision The man who brought me up sold me to a certain Rhoda in Rome. After many years, I met her again, and began to love her as a sister. Some time later, I saw her bathing in the Tiber, and gave her my hand to lead her out of the river. At the sight of her beauty, I thought to myself and said, How happy I would be! if I had a wife of such beauty and character. My reflections went thus far and no further. A little later, on my way into the countryside, while glorying in the greatness, splendor, and power of God's creatures, I fell into a trance as I walked. And a spirit seized me and carried me through a pathless region where no man could make his way, because it was very steep and eroded into ridges by the running waters. Therefore, when I had crossed that river and came to level ground, I knelt down and began praying to the Lord and confessing my sins. As I was praying, the heavens opened, and I saw that woman, with whom I had been enamored, saluting me from heaven with... Greetings, Hermes. With my eyes fixed on her, I said, Lady, what are you doing here? Her answer was, I have been taken up to reproach you of your sins before the Lord. To this I said, Are you here to reproach me at, at this moment? No, she said, But listen to what I am about to tell you. God who dwells in the heavens, who created what is from what is not, who increases and multiplies them for the sake of his holy church, is angry with you for your sins against me. In answer I said, Sinned against you? How so? Have I ever made a coarse remark to you? Have I not always esteemed you as a goddess? Did I not always honor you as a sister? Lady, why do you make these false charges of wickedness and uncleanness against me? With a laugh she said, The desire of evil did arise in your heart. Surely you must think it is evil if an evil desire arises in the heart of a righteous man. It is a sin, yes, a great sin, she said. For the righteous man aims at righteousness. As long as his aim is righteousness, his honor stands in heaven and he finds the Lord well disposed to all his ventures. But those who pursue evil in their hearts draw down death and captivity upon themselves, in particular those who reach out for this world and glory in their riches and do not hold fast to the blessings to come. Their souls will be filled with regret because they have no hope. Instead, they have abandoned themselves in their life. As for you, pray to God who will heal your sins, yours, your whole household, and those of all the holy ones. After she had spoken these words, the heavens were shut, and I was overwhelmed with sorrow and fear. And I said to myself, If even this sin is down on the record against me, how can I be saved? How can I propitiate God in regard to my sins, which are of the grossest character? With what words can I ask the Lord to be merciful to me? As I was reflecting upon and discerning these things in my heart, I saw before me a great white chair made of snow-white wool. Then an old woman dressed in an exceedingly brilliant garment approached me with a book in her hand. She sat down by herself and saluted me. Greetings, Hermas. In grief and tears I said to her, Greetings, lady. Then she said to me, Why are you so downcast, Hermas? You are always so patient and slow to anger, always merry. Why do you look so gloomy and uncheerful? I said to her, Because a very excellent lady declares that I sinned against her. Then she said, Far be such a deed from the servant of God. But the desire for her certainly did enter your heart. A thought such as this induces God's servants to sin. It is a wicked and horrible desire against a devout soul, which has already been tried and tested, to desire an evil deed, especially when that soul is Hermas, the mortified, who has abstained from all evil desires and is full of holy simplicity and great innocence. 
But this is not the reason why God's anger is stirred against you. Rather, it is in order that you may convert your household that has sinned against the Lord and against both of you, their parents. Now, because of your love for your children, you do not admonish them, but allow them to fall into dreadful corruption. This is the reason for the Lord's anger. Yet he will bring a remedy for all past evils committed in your household, since it is because of their sins and transgressions that you have fallen under the corruption of temporal affairs. But the great mercy of the Lord has taken pity on you and on your household, and will give you strength and establish you in his glory. At all events, do not become careless, but encourage and strengthen your household. For just as a smith, by hammering his work, obtains mastery of it for his purposes, so also does the righteous word spoken daily overcome all evil. Therefore, do not cease to admonish your children, for I know, if they repent with their whole heart, they will be inscribed in the books of life with the holy ones. After these remarks, she said to me, Do you wish to hear me read? Yes, lady, I said. She said to me, Then listen and hear the glories of God. Then I heard great and wondrous things from her, things I am unable to remember, for all her words were too frightening for men to comprehend. But I do remember her last remarks, for they were helpful for us and gentle. Behold the God of hosts, who has created the world with his invisible power, strength, and surpassing wisdom, and who in his glorious good pleasure has clothed his creation with beauty, and by his mighty word has firmly fixed the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth upon the waters, who in the wisdom and providence that belongs to him alone has founded his holy church and blessed it. Behold, he is removing the heavens, the mountains, the hills and seas, and everything is becoming level for his chosen ones, to give them the assurance that was promised with great glory and joy, provided they observe the commandments of God which they have received in great faith. Now, when she had finished reading and had risen from her throne, four young men came, who took the throne and went away to the east. Then she beckoned me, and touching my chest said, Were you pleased by what I read? And I said to her, Yes, lady. The last part pleased me, but the first part was difficult and stern. But she answered me, The last part was for the righteous, the first for heathen and apostates. While she was still speaking with me, two men appeared, lifted her by the arms, and went away to the east, in the same direction as her throne. But she went away with a smile and said to me as she left, Be of good courage, Hermas. Chapter 2 the second vision. As I was making my way into the countryside at the same time as last year, as I was walking along, I recalled the vision from last year. And once more, the Spirit seized me and carried me away to the same spot as in the past. Therefore, when I came to the place, I fell down on my knees and began praying to the Lord and glorifying His name since he had deemed me worthy of receiving the knowledge of my former sins. On rising from prayer, I saw before me the elderly lady that I had seen last year. She was walking and reading a little book. Then she said to me, Can you proclaim these things to God's elect? I answered her, Lady, I cannot remember so many things. Give me the book and I shall copy it. Take it and return it to me, she said. So I took it and went to a certain place in the field and copied everything letter by letter, for I had trouble making out the syllables. As I finished the last letters of the book, it was suddenly snatched from my hands by someone who I could not see. After fifteen days, when I had fasted and prayed much to the Lord, the meaning of the writing was revealed to me. This is what was written. Hermas, your offspring have rebelled against God and blasphemed against the Lord. 
They have betrayed their parents by notorious wickedness and are known as betrayers of parents. Yet their betrayal has done them no good. Instead, they have added even more to their iniquities, licentiousness, a mass of wickedness. In this way, they made full the measure of their lawlessness. Now, make this message known to your children, every one of them, and to your wife, who from now on will be as a sister to you. Yes, she also fails to restrain her tongue, and thus she commits sin. But after hearing this message, she will control herself and obtain mercy. For after you have made known to them this message the Master has commanded me to reveal to you, then all the sins that they have previously committed will be forgiven. Yes, and the holy ones who have sinned up to this time will be forgiven, provided they repent with their whole heart and rid themselves of double-mindedness. For the Master has sworn by his glory to his elect that if any of them sin after a certain day which has been fixed, he shall not attain salvation. Repentance for the righteous has an end. The days of repentance for all the holy ones have reached their fullness. But for the heathen, repentance will be possible even until the last day. Therefore, tell the elders of the church to rectify their ways in righteousness, that they may fully receive the promises with great glory. Therefore, stand firm, all you who work righteousness, and be single-minded, that your passage may be in the company of the holy angels. Blessed are those of you who will endure the great tribulation that is to come, and those of you who will not deny their life. For the Lord has sworn by his Son that those who have denied their Christ have been rejected from their life, that is, those who are on the brink of denying in the days to come. But to those who have formerly denied him, mercy has been granted because of his great compassion. But as for you, Hermas, do not remember the wrongs done to you by your children, nor neglect your sister that they may be cleansed of their former sins. For they will be chastised with just chastisement, provided you do not remember the wrongs they have done you, for resentment is the bringer of death. As for you, Hermas, you have had many trials of your own on account of the transgressions of your household, because you did not give them proper attention. Yes, you neglected them and became severely involved in your own wicked transactions. But your refusal to fall away from the living God, your simplicity, and your great self-control are saving you. These things have saved you, provided you endure, and they are saving all who do the same and who walk in innocence and simplicity. Those who possess such virtues shall gain the mastery over every form of wickedness and are going to stand fast until life everlasting. Blessed are all those who act righteously, for they shall never be destroyed. Tell Maximus, see, the tribulation is coming if you decide to deny the faith again. The Lord is close to those who turn to him, as it is written in Eldad and Medad, who prophesied to the people in the desert. Brethren, while I slept, a revelation was given to me by an exceedingly handsome young man, who said, The old lady from whom you received the small book, who do you think she is? The Sibyl? I answered. No, you are mistaken, he said. Who is she then? I said. The church, he said. I asked him, Why is she an old woman? Because she was created before all things, he said. For this reason she is old, and it is for her sake that the world was made. After this, I had a vision in my house. And that old lady came and asked me whether I had already given the book to the elders. And I said that I had not. You have done well, she said. I have some words to add. When I have finished them all, they will be made known to all the elect through you. Therefore, write two small books, 
one for Clement and one for Grapti. Clement will then send it to the cities abroad, since this is his duty, and Grapti will admonish the widows and orphans. But you shall read it in this city together with the elders who preside in the church. Chapter 3 The Third Vision Brethren, this is the vision I had. After much fasting and asking the Lord to show me the revelation which he promised to show me through the old lady, on that very night, she appeared to me and said to me, Since you are so deficient, yet eager to know all things, go into the field where you are farming, and I shall appear to you at about the fifth hour and show you what you must see. Then I asked her a question, Lady, into what part of the field am I to go? Wherever you please, she answered. I chose a beautiful and secluded spot. But before I could speak and tell her of the spot, she said, I shall come wherever you please. Therefore, brethren, I went into the field and counted the hours and came to the place where I had told her to meet me at. And I saw an ivory couch set up. On the couch was placed a linen cushion and on top, a coverlet of finely woven linen was spread out. When I saw these objects arranged in this manner, but that there was not a person in the place, I was seized with terror and began shuddering. My hair stood on end, and unreasoning fear came upon me because I was alone. Therefore, when I came to myself and took courage and recalled God's glory, I fell to my knees. Once more, as on the former occasion, I confessed my sins to the Lord. At this point, she came with six young men, whom I had also seen before, and stood by me. She listened as I prayed and confessed my sins to the Lord. Then she touched me and said, Hermas, cease praying about all your sins. Instead, ask for righteousness so that you may take a portion of it to your household. Then she raised me up by the hand and led me to the couch and said to the young men, Go and build. After the young men had departed and, when we were alone, she said to me, Sit here. I said to her, Lady, let the elders be seated first. Do as I tell you, she said. Sit down. Then, when I wished to sit down on the right side, she did not allow me but with her hand motioned me to sit on the left. As I was reflecting and brooding about this, that she would not allow me to sit on the right, she said to me, Are you grieved, Hermas? The place at the right belongs to others, those who have already been approved by God and have suffered for the sake of the name. There still remains much for you to do before you can sit with them, but persist in your single-mindedness, as you are now doing, and you will sit with them and with all who do what they have done and who endure what they have endured. What have they endured? I said. Listen, she said. Scourgings, prisons, great tribulations, crucifixions, wild beasts, for the sake of the name. For this reason, they are at the right hand of holiness as well as anyone who suffers for the name. The left side is for the rest. But the same bounty and the same promises are reserved for both those sitting on the right and those sitting on the left. There is only this difference, that those who have suffered and sit at the right enjoy a certain distinction. Now you are eager to sit with those on the right, but your shortcomings are too numerous. But you will be purified of shortcomings, as will all who are single-minded will be purified of all sins up to this day. With these remarks, she wished to depart. But I fell at her feet and begged her by the Lord to show me the vision she had promised to show me. Therefore, she once again took me by the hand, raised me up, and made me sit on the couch at the left, while she sat down to the right. Then she raised a shining rod and said to me, Do you see something great? I answered, Lady, I see nothing. Then she said to me, Look, do you not see before you a large tower being built upon the waters with shining square stones? 
Now the tower was being built in the shape of a square by the six young men who had accompanied her. But about 10,000 other men were bringing along stones, some of them out of the depths, others from the land. And they were distributing them to the six young men who were taking them and building. All the stones that were dragged out of the depths, they were put into the building just as they were, for they had been shaped to fit right into joint with the other stones. In fact, they fitted so snugly with one another that the line of contact did not show. The structure of the tower appeared to be made of a single stone. Of the other stones, those taken from the dry land, some they threw away, and some they put into the building, while others were broken up and thrown far away from the tower. But there were many other stones lying about the tower that were not being used in the building, for some of them had spots, others had cracks, some were chipped, and others were white and round, unable to fit into the building. Moreover, I saw other stones thrown at a great distance from the tower that fell into the road and did not remain there, but rolled into pathless places. Other stones fell into fire and were burned, while still others fell near water and yet were unable to roll into the water, in spite of their desire to continue rolling and come to the water. After showing me these things, she was in a hurry to depart. I said to her, Lady, what good is it for me to have seen these things and not to know what they mean? Insistent fellow, she said. You do wish to know about the tower? Yes, lady, I answered, in order that I may tell my brothers that upon hearing these things they may know the Lord with great glory. And she said, Many will listen, and some will rejoice, but some too will weep. But even the latter, if they listen and repent, will also rejoice. Now let me tell you the parables of the tower. I shall reveal everything to you, and do not trouble me any more about the revelation, since these revelations are at an end. They have been completed. Yet you will not cease asking for revelations, shameless as you are. The tower which you see being built, that is I, the Church, who has appeared to you now and on the former occasion. Therefore, ask me whatever you wish about the tower, and I shall reveal it to you, that you may rejoice along with the Holy Ones. I said to her, Lady, since on one occasion you considered me worthy of the whole revelation, reveal it. She said to me, Whatever is given to you to be revealed will be revealed. Only let your heart be directed to God and do not be double-minded about whatever you will see. Then I asked her, Lady, why is the tower built upon the waters? She said, Yes. As I told you before, you do inquire persistently. With your inquiries, you are finding the truth. The reason why the tower is built upon the water is this. Your life has been and will be saved through water. The tower has been set on a foundation by the word of the omnipotent and glorious name, and it is sustained together by the Master's invisible power. In answer, I said to her, Lady, this is a great and marvelous thing. But lady, the young men, the six who are building, who are they? These are the holy angels of God, the first to be created, to whom he has handed over his whole creation that they might increase and build up and to govern all creation. By their agency, the building of the tower will be perfected. And who are the others who are dragging along stones? These are also God's holy angels, but the former six are superior to them. With their help, the tower will be perfected, and all will rejoice together around the tower and give glory to God, because the building of the tower has been perfected. I spoke and asked her, Lady, I would like to know what is the destination of the stones and their meaning. In answer, she said to me, not because you are more worthy to receive the revelation than all the rest of men, 
for others are ahead of you and worthier, and it would be right for them to have the revelation. But that God's name may be glorified, the revelation has been made and will be made to you for the sake of the double-minded and those who debate in their hearts whether these things will be or not. Tell them that all these things are true, and none of them are beside the truth. All of them are thoroughly secure, firm, and established upon a strong foundation. Now, let me tell you about the stones that go into the building. The square white stones that fit exactly into their joints, these are the apostles, overseers, teachers, and ministers who walk in accordance with the reverence of God who have overseen and taught and ministered the elect of God in purity and sanctity. Some of them have fallen asleep, and some are still living. Now they have always been in mutual agreement. They are at peace with one another and listen to one another. For this reason, their joints fit exactly into the building of the tower. But who are the stones which were dragged from the depths, which were laid into the tower? whose joints fit together with the rest of the stones previously placed in the building. These are the ones who have suffered for the name of the Lord. Lady, please let me know who are the other stones taken from the dry land, she said. Those going into the building without being cut are the ones whom the Lord has approved, because they walk in the straight way of the Lord and strictly observe His commandments. And who are those that are being brought and placed in the building? These are the ones who are young in the faith and are faithful. But they are admonished by the angels to do good, and for this reason no evil was discovered in them. Who are the ones whom they rejected and threw away? Those are the sinners who wish to repent. They have not been thrown at a great distance from the tower, because if they do repent, they will still be useful in the building. Now. Those who are about to repent will be strong in the faith when they actually do, provided they repent now, while the tower is in the process of being built. But if the building has been completed, there will no longer be a place for them, but they will be cast out. Their only advantage is that they now lie close to the tower. Do you wish to know who those are that have been broken up into fragments and thrown far from the tower? They are the sons of lawlessness. Their belief was hypocrisy, and wickedness in its fullness did not depart from them. Therefore, because of their wickedness, they have no salvation since they are of no use for the building. Therefore, they have been broken into fragments and thrown far from the tower because of the Lord's anger and because they provoked Him to anger. The many other stones which you see lying around without going into the building are the stones with spots who knew the truth but failed to persist in it and did not continue to adhere to the Holy Ones. Consequently, they are useless. Who are the stones with cracks in them? These are the ones who hold things against each other in their hearts and are not at peace with one another. They have only a semblance of peace, but when they separate from one another, discord remains in their hearts. These are the cracks in the stones. The stones that are chipped are believers. They are righteous for the most part, but a certain measure of lawlessness lingers in them. Hence, they are chipped and not perfect in every respect. But lady, who are the white round stones that do not fit into the building? She answered and said, How long are you going to be foolish and senseless? All these questions, do you not understand anything? These are the ones who have the faith but also the riches of this world. Therefore, when persecution comes, they deny their Lord because of their riches and their business affairs. I answered and said to her, Lady, when will they be useful for the building? Whenever the riches that lead their hearts astray have been torn from them, she said, then will they be useful to God. Just as the round stone cannot be made square unless portions be cut off and cast away, so also the rich in this world cannot be made useful for the Lord, unless their riches have been cut out of them. Learn from your own experience. When you were rich, you were useless, but now you are useful and a help to life. Be useful to God, or you are taken from the same stones. The other stones which you see thrown far from the tower 
falling on the road and rolling off it into pathless places, are those who have believed. But because of their double-mindedness, they have deviated from their true road because they thought they could find a better one. Therefore, they wander in distress, walking about in pathless places. But those who fall into fire and are burned are the ones who have completely apostatized from the living God, into whose hearts repentance no longer enters because of their unbridled lust and the impious acts that they put into execution. Do you wish to know who are the other stones that have fallen near the waters but cannot roll into them? These are the ones who have heard the word and wish to be immersed in the name of the Lord, but then change their mind when they recall the purity demanded by the truth and return to their evil desires. With this, she finished her explanation of the tower. But unabashed, I asked her another question. Is repentance possible for all these stones that have been thrown away and do not fit into the tower? And will they still have a place in the tower? They can repent, but they cannot fit into this tower, she said. They will be laid into another and much inferior place, but only after they have been chastised and fulfilled the days of their sins. But since they have been partakers of the righteous word, they will be transferred to a different place. And then, only if the thought of repenting for the evil deeds that they have performed comes into their hearts, they will be relieved of their chastisements. But if the thought does not come into their hearts, they will not be saved because of the hardness of heart. When I ceased asking questions about all these matters, she said to me, Do you wish to see something else? As I was eager to see more, I was overjoyed at the prospect of seeing visions. She looked at me with a smile and said, Do you see seven women around the tower? Yes, lady, I said. This tower is being supported by them in accordance with the Lord's command. Now let me tell you their functions. The first of them, who is clasping her hands together, is called Faith. God's elect are saved through her. The second, who has her garment tucked up and acts with vigor, is called Continence. She is the daughter of Faith. Whoever follows her will be happy in his life because he will abstain from all evil deeds in the assurance that by abstaining from all evil desire, he will inherit eternal life. But the others, who are they, lady? They are the daughters one of the other. Their names are simplicity, knowledge, innocence, reverence, and love. When you perform all the acts of their mother, then you are able to live. Lady, I said, I would like to know what power each of them possesses. You shall be told what kinds of powers they have, she said. Their powers are regulated by each other, and they follow one another in the order in which they are born. Continence is the daughter of faith. Simplicity of continence. Innocence of simplicity. Reverence of innocence. Knowledge of reverence. Love of knowledge. Their acts then are pure, reverent, and divine. Whoever serves them and embraces their acts will have a dwelling in the tower along with God's holy ones. Then I asked her whether the consummation of the ages had arrived yet. And she cried out with a loud voice, saying, Foolish man! Do you not see that the tower is still being built? Whenever the building of the tower is completed, that will be the end. But I assure you it will be built up quickly. Do not ask me any more questions. Let this reminder and the renewal of your souls be sufficient for you and for the Holy Ones. But this revelation has not been made for you alone, but that you may make it known to everyone after three days, for you must understand this first. My command, Hermas, is for you to speak all the words I am about to tell you into the ears of the faithful. Thus, when they hear and do them, they will be cleansed from their wickedness, you along with them. My children, listen to me. I brought you up in great simplicity and innocence and reverence because of the Lord's mercy. He instilled righteousness into you that you might be justified and sanctified from all wickedness and all perversity. But you did not wish to desist from your wickedness. Now, therefore, listen to me. 
be at peace with one another, look after one another, bear each other's burdens. Furthermore, do not partake of God's creatures superabundantly alone, but also give a share to those who have less. For some people, from the abundance of their food, bring on sickness to their flesh and weaken it, while others, who do not have food, are weakened in the flesh from lack of sufficient food, and their body is ruined. Therefore, this failure to share is harmful to you who have abundance and fail to distribute to those who are needy. Give heed to the judgment that is to come. Seek out those who are hungry as long as the tower is not yet finished, you who have a superabundance. For after the completion of the tower, you will be wishing to do good and will not have an opportunity. Now then, you who pride yourselves on your wealth, take care lest the indigent groan at any time and their groan mount up to the Lord and you and your goods shall be shut out from the door of the tower. At this point it is to you, the elders of the church, and to those in the first seats that I speak. Do not be like poisoners. They carry their poison in boxes, whereas you carry venom and poison in your hearts. You are hardened and do not wish to cleanse your hearts. You do not wish to mix together your wisdom in a clean heart that you may obtain mercy from the great king. Watch then, my children, lest these dissensions deprive you of your life. How do you expect to discipline the elect of the Lord if you have no discipline yourselves? Therefore, discipline yourselves and live in peace with one another, that I, for my part, may take my stand before the Father and joyfully give an account of you to your Lord. Now, when she finished speaking with me, the six young men who were builders came and took her to the tower, while four others took up the couch and also brought it to the tower. I did not see their faces because they were turned away from me. As she was departing, I asked her to give me a revelation about the three forms in which she had appeared to me. You must ask another for a revelation about this matter. In the former vision last year, brethren, she had appeared to me as very old and seated on a chair. In the second vision, her countenance was younger, but her flesh and hair were old, and she had spoken to me standing up, though she looked more cheerful than before. But in the third vision, she was youthful in every respect and of surpassing beauty. Only her hair was that of an old lady, and towards the end, she was quite joyful and seated on a couch. I was very deeply depressed because I wished to understand the revelation. Now in a night vision, I beheld the old woman speaking to me. Every question requires humility of spirit, therefore fast, and you will receive from the Lord what you ask. Therefore I fasted for a day, and that same night a young man appeared to me, who said to me, why do you always ask for instant revelations in your prayer? Be careful, lest you may injure your flesh by heavy requests. The present revelations are all you need. Can you see greater revelations than those you have seen? In answer, I said to him, Sir, I am only asking for a revelation complete in every detail about the three forms of the old lady. In answer, he said to me, How long are you going to be without perception? It is your double-mindedness that makes you so, and the failure to have your heart directed to the Lord. Again, I said in answer, Well, we shall know this more accurately with your help, sir. I shall tell you about the three forms that you are inquiring about. He said, Why did she appear to you as an old woman sitting on a chair in the first vision? Because your spirits were old and already wasting away, and have become infirm from your softness and double-mindedness. For just as old men, no longer having hope of renewing their youth, have nothing else to look forward to except their final rest, 
so you also, weakened by temporal affairs, have surrendered to indifference instead of casting your cares upon the Lord. Yes, your spirit has been broken, and you have grown old with your griefs. Sir, I would like to know why she was sitting in a chair. Because every weak person sits in a chair on account of his weakness, that his weak body might find support. Here you have the meaning of the first vision. In the second vision, you saw her standing with a younger countenance, and more cheerful in comparison with the first time, although her flesh and hair were those of an old woman. Now listen to this parable also. When an old man, who has already given up hope because of his weakness and poverty, and waits for nothing more except the last day of his life, suddenly receives an inheritance, he rises at the news, is exceedingly happy, and gathers strength. He no longer lies prone, but stands up and his spirit is rejuvenated, though it was broken by his former practices. He no longer sits, but takes courage. In the same way, all of you were also rejuvenated when you heard the revelation which the Lord revealed to you. Because the Lord has had mercy on you and has renewed your spirits, you have put aside your weaknesses, strength returned to you, and you were empowered in the faith, while the Lord at the sight of your strengthening rejoiced. For this reason he made clear to you the building of the tower and will clarify other matters, provided you live wholeheartedly at peace with one another. In the third vision you saw her as a younger lady, beautiful and joyous, and her appearance too was beautiful. For a man immediately forgets former sorrows when good news comes in the midst of grief. He excludes everything except the good news he has heard. He is strengthened to do good from then on. In his joy his spirit is rejuvenated. So all of you also receive rejuvenated spirits at the sight of these benefits. Now, the fact that you saw her sitting on a couch means the position is secure. For the couch had four feet and was securely fixed, just as the world is supported by four elements. Therefore, those who repent thoroughly will become young and firmly established. I mean, those who repent with their whole heart. Here you have the complete revelation. Do not ask for anything more about a revelation, but if anything is necessary, it will be revealed to you. Chapter 4 The Fourth Vision Brethren, twenty days after the former vision had been given, I saw another vision, which is a figure of the tribulation that is to come. I was leaving for the country by the Via Capanna. The place is about ten stadia off the public road and easily reached. So, as I was walking alone, I thanked the Lord for the revelations and visions that He had shown me through His holy church, and begged Him to round them out. I begged him to strengthen me and to grant repentance to his servants who had stumbled, that his great and glorious name might be glorified, for he deemed me worthy to show me these wonders. As I was praising and giving thanks to him, an echo, as it were, of my voice answered me, Do not be double-minded, Hermas. I began to weigh this and say to myself, How can I be double-minded after having been so firmly established by the Lord and after having seen such glorious things? Therefore, brethren, I advanced a little closer, and behold, I saw a cloud of dust reaching up, as it were, to the heavens. I then began to say to myself, are cattle now approaching and raising a cloud? 
it was about a stadia from me. As it was growing ever bigger, I suspected it was some supernatural apparition. The sun shone a little, and behold, I saw a huge beast, something like a sea monster, with fiery locusts emerging from its mouth. The beast was about a hundred feet long, and its head seemed to be of earthenware. As I began to cry and to ask the Lord to deliver me from it, I recalled the words which I had heard. Hermes, do not be double-minded in your heart. Therefore, brethren, I clothe myself with the faith of the Lord. In recalling the wonderful things he had taught me, I boldly face the beast. Now the beast charged with such noise and force, capable of destroying a city. I came close to it, and the monster, large as it was, only stretched itself on the ground, doing nothing except project its tongue. In fact, there was no stir in it at all until I had passed by. The beast had four colors on its head, black, then the color of fire and blood, next gold, finally white. After I had gone approximately 30 feet past the beast, behold, a virgin met me, adorned as if she were coming from a bridal chamber, clothed entirely in white and with white sandals. She was veiled to the forehead, and her headdress was a turban, but her hair was white. I knew from former visions that it was the church, and so I became more cheerful. She saluted me with the words, Greetings, my good man. My salutation in turn was, Greetings, lady. In answer, she said to me, Have you met anything? Lady, I said to her, I was met by a beast of such size, capable of destroying peoples. But by the power of the Lord and his abundant mercy, I escaped from it. She said, Yes, indeed, you escaped, because you cast your care on God and you opened up your heart to the Lord in the assurance that you can be saved by nothing except his great and glorious name. Hence, the Lord has sent his angel, who is set over the beast, whose name is Thegri. He has shut its mouth, that it may not hurt you. By your faith you have escaped great tribulation, because at the sight of such a great monster you are not swayed by double-mindedness. Now depart and explain to the Lord's elect these mighty deeds, and tell them that this beast is a figure of the great tribulation that is to come. If all of you prepare in advance and repent to the Lord with all your hearts, you will be able to escape it, provided your hearts become pure and sinless and you serve your Lord blamelessly the rest of the days of your life. Cast your cares upon the Lord and he will set them straight. Put your faith in the Lord, you double-minded men, because he can do all things and can avert his wrath from you while he sends scourges upon you, the double-minded. Woe to those who hear these words and disobey. It were better for them not to have been born. I asked her a question about the four colors on the head of the beast. She answered and said, Again, you are curious about such matters? Yes, lady, I said. Tell me what this means. I will tell you, she said. The black is this world in which all of you live. The color of fire and blood means that this world must be destroyed in fire and blood. You who have fled this world are the golden section. For just as gold is tried by fire and becomes useful, so also you who live in the world are tried in it. Therefore, those who remain in it and pass through the flames will be purified. For just as gold casts off its dross, so you also will cast off all sorrow and anguish, becoming pure and useful for the building of the tower. Finally, the white section is the world to come in which the elect of God dwell, for those chosen by God for eternal life will be without spot 
and pure. Therefore, do not stop speaking these things into the ears of God's holy ones. This, then, is the figure of the great tribulation that is to come. But if you have good will, it will come to nothing. Remember those things which have already been written. With this she departed, but I did not see where she went, for there was a cloud, and I turned back in fear, thinking that the beast was coming. Chapter 5 The Fifth Vision As I was praying in my house and sat upon my bed, a man of glorious appearance entered. He was dressed like a shepherd, with a white goat skin wrapped about him, a bag over his shoulders, and a staff in his hand. He greeted me, and I returned his greeting. Sitting beside me, he said immediately, I have been sent by the most venerable angel to dwell with you for the remainder of the days of your life. Thinking he was here to tempt me, I said to him, Who are you? For I know to whom I was entrusted. He said, Do you not recognize me? No, I said. I am the shepherd to whom you have been entrusted. As he was still talking, his form changed, and I recognized that this was the one to whom I had been entrusted. I was confounded at once, and fear took hold of me. I was completely overcome with regret for having answered him so wickedly and senselessly. But he answered and said to me, Do not be confounded, but draw strength from the commandments I am going to give you. Then he said, for I have been sent to show you once more everything that you have previously seen, especially the most important matters, those useful to you. First of all, write my commandments in parables. Write the rest in the order I shall indicate to you. Then he said, The reason why I am commanding you to write the commandments in parables first is so you may have them to read easily and then keep them. So I wrote the commandments in parables as he ordered me. If all of you hear and keep them, and walk in them, and fulfill them in a pure heart, you will receive from the Lord what he promised you. But if you hear them and do not repent, or even add to your sins, you will receive the contrary from the Lord. All this the shepherd, the angel of repentance, commanded me to write. Chapter 6 The First Mandate First of all, believe that God is one, that He created all things and set them in order, that He made all things out of nothing, and that though He contains all things, He alone is not contained. Therefore, trust Him and fear Him, and in this fear be self-controlled. Observe this mandate and cast all wickedness far away from you. Clothe yourself with every excellence that goes with righteousness, and you will live to God, provided you observe this commandment. Chapter 7 The Second Mandate He said to me, Hold fast to simplicity of heart and innocence. Yes, be as infants who do not know the wickedness that destroys the life of men. First of all, do not slander anyone and do not listen readily to a slanderer. Otherwise you, the listener, will be guilty of the sin of the slanderer if you believe the slander you hear. For by believing it, you yourself will hold a grudge against your brother and thus you will be guilty of the sin of the slanderer. Slander is wicked, a restless demon, never at peace, but always dwelling amid dissensions. Keep away from it and you will always have harmony with all men. Clothe yourself with reverence in which there is no evil, which gives no stumbling block, but in which is all smoothness and cheerfulness. Do good, and from the fruit of your labors which God gives you, 
give to all those in need, without distinction, not debating to whom you will and to whom you will not give. Give to everyone since it is God's will that we give to everyone from His bounties. Those who have received will give an account to God why they received and for what purpose. For those who receive in distress will not be judged, but those who receive under false pretenses will pay the penalty. Under these circumstances the giver is innocent, for on receiving from the Lord a service to perform, he performed it with simplicity, without distinguishing to whom to give and to whom not to give. The service, then performed with simplicity, becomes honorable in God's eyes. Therefore the man who thus serves with simplicity will live to God. Therefore keep this commandment as I have told you, that you and your house may be found sincere in your repentance and your heart cleaned and unsullied. Chapter 8 The Third Mandate Again he spoke to me, Love truth, and let nothing but truth proceed from your mouth, in order that the spirit which God has settled in this flesh of yours may be found to be truthful in the sight of all men. Thus, the Lord who dwells in you will be glorified, since the Lord is truthful in every word and there is no falsehood in him. This is why liars disavow the Lord and defraud him, since they do not return the deposit which they have received. For they received a spirit in which there is no falsehood. If they return a spirit of falsehood, they have polluted the commandment and committed fraud. On hearing this, I wept copiously. At the sight of my tears, he said, Why do you weep? And I said, Because, sir, I do not know whether it is possible for me to be saved. Why? He said. And I said, Because, sir, I have never spoken a true word in my life, and at all times I have lived like a villain among all men, and have dressed up my lie as the truth in the eyes of all. At no time have I been contradicted by anyone, but they have put faith in my word. Sir, I said, how can I live after having done this? Your thinking is indeed noble and true, he said, for it is your duty as the servant of God to walk in truth and not allow an evil conscience to dwell in the company of the Spirit of Truth. Neither should you grieve the holy and true spirit. I said, Sir, never before have I understood these commands so clearly. Now you hear them, he said. Keep them so even the lies formerly uttered in your business transactions may become credible, now that your present statements have been found true. It truly is possible for these business lies to become credible. For if you keep watch over what you say and speak nothing but the truth from now on, you can obtain life for yourself. And anyone who hears this commandment and abstains from that most pernicious habit lying will live to God. Chapter 9 The Fourth Mandate He said, I command you to guard your chastity. Do not let it enter your heart to think of another man's wife nor about fornication, nor any such thing. If you do, you will commit a serious sin. Always keep your wife in mind and you will never fall into sin. For if this desire comes into your heart, you will make a slip and you will commit sin, or if any other such wicked thought enters your heart. For a desire of this kind is a serious sin for the servant of God, and if anyone puts such a wicked thought into execution, he draws death upon himself. Therefore be on your guard, abstain from this desire. Where holiness dwells, there in the heart of a righteous man, lawlessness should not enter. I said to him, Sir, allow me to ask you a few questions. 
Ask them. He said. I said, Sir, if a man has a wife who believes in the Lord and detects her in adultery, does he commit sin if he continues to live with her? And he said to me, As long as he remains ignorant, he does not. But if her husband knows about the sin, and she does not repent, but persists in her fornication, he becomes guilty of her sin as long as he lives with her and an accomplice in her adultery. And I said to him, What then, sir, is he to do if the wife continues in this passion? And he said, Let him divorce her and remain alone. But if he divorces her and marries another, he himself commits adultery. And I said to him, But sir, what if after the divorce the wife repents and wishes to return to her husband? Should he refuse to receive her? No, indeed, he said. If the husband does not receive her, he sins. He incurs a great sin. For the sinner who has repented must be taken back. However, not often, for there is but one repentance for the servants of God. Therefore, to bring about her repentance, the husband ought not to marry. This same principle applies to both husband and wife. Not only is it adultery for a man to pollute his flesh, he said, but it is likewise adultery for anyone to imitate the heathen in their actions. Therefore, if anyone persists in acts of this kind and does not repent, withdraw from him. Do not live with him. Otherwise you will also have a part in his sin. It is for this reason that all of you were commanded to live by yourselves, whether husband or wife be guilty. For under these circumstances repentance is possible. Then he said, I am not giving an excuse for the matter to end in this way, but merely that the sinner may sin no more. There is one who can give a remedy for his former sin, the one who has power over all things. Once more I asked him and said, Since the Lord has thought me worthy to have you live with me always, bear with me a few more words, since I do not understand at all, and my heart has been hardened by my past. Give me understanding, for I am exceedingly stupid, and understand absolutely nothing. He answered and said to me, I am set over repentance and give understanding to all who repent. Do you not think that it is great wisdom to repent? He asked. Repentance is deep understanding. He continued. For when the man who has sinned understands that he has done evil in the sight of the Lord, awareness of the deed he committed enters his heart, and he repents never to commit evil again. Instead, he does good perfectly by humbling his soul and putting it to the torture, because it is sinned. Do you see now how repentance is great wisdom? And I said, Sir, this is why I am making careful inquiries into everything. In the first place, I am a sinner, and then, I do not know what works I am to perform to live, for my sins are numerous and varied. And he said, You will live if you keep my commandments and walk in them. Whoever hears my commandments and keeps them will live to God. May I press on with my questions, sir? I asked. Speak, he said. And I said, Sir, I have been told by some teachers that there is no other repentance except the one that takes place when we descended into the water and received remission of our former sins. He said to me, You have heard well, for that is truly the case. For the person who has received remission of sins must no longer sin but remain in purity. But since you are inquiring diligently into everything, I shall also clarify this matter for you without giving an excuse either to those who now believe or will believe in the Lord. For those who now believe or will believe do not have repentance for sins, 
but they do have remission of their former sins. For the Lord has prescribed repentance to those who were called before these days. For the Lord has knowledge of hearts and knows all things in advance, the weakness of men and the cunning craft of the devil, the evil he will inflict upon the servants of God and his wickedness against them. Therefore the Lord in his exceeding mercy took pity on his creatures and prescribed this occasion for repentance. Authority over this repentance has been given to me. But this I say to you, he said, after that solemn and holy call, if a man sins after severe temptation by the devil, he has one chance of repentance. But if he sins and repents frequently after this, it is unprofitable for such a man. Only with difficulty will he live. I said to him, I have been restored to life by hearing these accurate statements of yours. For now, I know that if I do not commit additional sins, I shall be saved. You will be saved as well as all those who do this, he said. Once more I spoke and asked him, Sir, since you have borne with me once, make this also clear to me. Speak, he said, and I said, Sir, if a wife or husband falls asleep and the widower or widow marries, does he or she sin? There is no sin, he said. But anyone who remains single achieves greater honor for himself and great glory before the Lord. But even in remarriage there is no sin. Therefore guard your purity and modesty and you will live to God. All that I am telling you and will tell you, observe from now on, yes, from the day on which you were entrusted to me, and I shall dwell in your house. There will be remission for your former lapses if you observe my commandments. There will also be remission for all who observe these commandments and walk in this chastity. Chapter 10, The Fifth Mandate He said, Be long-suffering and prudent, and you will obtain the mastery over wickedness and accomplish all righteousness. For if you are long-suffering, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you will be pure, not overshadowed by any other spirit of evil. But dwelling in a spacious place, it will rejoice and be glad along with the vessel in which it resides. Thus it will serve God with abundant cheerfulness, because it has His great peace within itself. But if violent temper enters, the Good Spirit, in its sensitiveness, is immediately confined since it no longer has a clean habitation. Therefore it seeks to withdraw from the place. For the evil spirit chokes it. It is unable to serve God in accordance with his wishes. It is befouled with the violent temper. For the Lord dwells amid long suffering, but the devil has his abode in violent temper. Therefore if both spirits dwell in the same place, it is unprofitable and evil for the man in whom they dwell. Take a little wormwood and pour it into a jar of honey. Is not the honey spoiled altogether? Even a great quantity of honey is ruined by the smallest amount of wormwood, and its sweetness is lost. It is no longer pleasant to the owner, because it has been mixed and it is no longer enjoyable. Now if no wormwood is put into the honey, it turns out to be sweet and becomes useful for the owner. You see then that long-suffering is very sweet, far more than honey, and useful to the Lord. His dwelling is in long-suffering. On the contrary, violent temper is bitter and useless. Therefore, if violent temper is mixed with long-suffering, the latter is spoiled and the man's prayer is no longer useful to God. Sir, I would like to know the operation of violent temper, that I may be on my guard against it, I said. Yes, indeed, he replied. If you do not guard against it, you and your household lose all hope of salvation. 
Therefore guard yourself against it, for I shall be on your side. And all who repent with their whole heart will be preserved from it. I shall be on their side and shall watch carefully in their behalf, for all of them have been justified by the Most Holy Angel. Then he said, Now I shall tell you how wicked is the operation of violent temper, how it ravages the servants of God, how it makes them turn away from righteousness. Now it does not cause the majority of those who are in the faith to turn away, neither is it able to operate against them because the power of the Lord is on their side. But it causes the empty-minded and the double-minded to turn away. For when it sees people of this kind in prosperity, it insinuates itself into the heart of such a person, and for no reason at all, the man or woman is embittered over worldly concerns, either about food or some trifle, some friend, a benefaction or a gift, or other such foolish matters. All this is foolish, vain, senseless, and unprofitable to the servants of God. But long-suffering is great and steadfast, sturdy and powerful. It prospers expansively. It is cheerful, joyous, carefree. It praises the Lord at all times. It has no bitterness in itself, but in all circumstances it remains meek and calm. Therefore, this long-suffering dwells with those who hold on to the faith in its perfection. Now, in the first place, violent temper is foolish, frivolous, and silly. In the next place, bitterness arises from silliness, from bitterness passion, from passion anger, and from anger rage. Finally, the rage that has in it such evil elements becomes a serious and incurable sin. For when all such spirits dwell in one vessel along with the Holy Spirit, it cannot hold them, but overflows. Then the delicate spirit that is not accustomed to dwell with an evil spirit, nor with hardness, departs from a man of this kind and seeks to dwell in a gentle, calm abode. Then when it is left, the man in whom it dwelled becomes emptied of the righteous spirit. And being, from then on, filled with evil spirits, he is in a state of anarchy in all his actions, being dragged here and there by evil spirits. He is completely blind to all good intentions. This is what happens to those subject to violent temper. Therefore, keep away from violent temper, the most wicked spirit. Be clothed with long suffering and oppose violent temper as well as bitterness, and your place will be on the side of holiness, beloved by the Lord. Therefore, make certain that you do not neglect this commandment. For if you master this commandment, you will also be able to keep the other commandments which I am about to lay upon you. Therefore be strong and powerful in these commandments, and let all those who wish to walk in them also become thus strengthened. Chapter 11 The Sixth Mandate In the first mandate I directed you to attend to faith and fear and self-restraint. He said, Yes, sir. I said, But now I wish to explain their nature, that you may know what power each possesses. Their effects are twofold, for they relate both to the righteous and to the unrighteous. Trust righteousness, but distrust unrighteousness. For the path of righteousness is straight, but wickedness is a crooked path. Therefore, walk on the straight and smooth path, and leave the crooked path alone. For there are no beaten tracks on the crooked path. Instead, there is nothing but pathless places and numerous stumbling blocks. It is rough and full of thorns. Therefore, it is injurious to those who walk in it. Those who take the straight path walk smoothly without stumbling, because it is neither rough nor thorny. Therefore, you see that it is more advantageous for you to walk on this road. Sir, it is a pleasure to walk on this road, I said. Then walk in it, he said. And anyone who turns to the Lord wholeheartedly will also walk there. 
Now I'm going to tell you about faith, he said. There are two angels who accompany man, the angel of righteousness and the angel of wickedness. And I said to him, But how am I to know their operations if both are dwelling with me? Listen, and you will understand them, he said. The angel of righteousness is sensitive, modest, gentle, and tranquil. Therefore, when this angel comes into your heart, he will immediately converse with you about righteousness, purity, holiness, self-control, every righteous work and glorious virtue. When all these thoughts enter your heart, you can be sure that the angel of righteousness is with you. These are the deeds of the angel of righteousness. Therefore, believe him as well as his deeds. Now observe the deeds of the angel of wickedness. First of all, he is of violent temper, bitter and silly. His deeds are evil, the ruin of the servants of God. Therefore, when he enters your heart, know him from his deeds. Sir, I do not know how I shall recognize him, I said. I shall tell you, he said. When violent temper comes over you or bitterness, you can tell that he is within you. Then there arises the craving for excessive action, extravagance in many things to eat and drink, numerous feasts, varied unnecessary dishes, the desire for women, covetousness, arrogance, boasting, and a host of similar related excesses. When they arise in your heart, you can tell that the angel of wickedness is with you. Now that you know his deeds, keep away from him and put no trust in him, because his deeds are wicked and against the interests of God's servants. Here you have the workings of the two spirits. Understand them and trust the angel of righteousness. Keep away from the angel of wickedness because his teaching is evil in every respect. For even though a man is most faithful, if the desire of this angel arises in the heart, that man or woman is bound to commit some sin. Now on the other hand, though a man or woman is most wicked, when the deeds of the angel of righteousness arises in the heart, they must necessarily perform a good action. Then he said, So you see that it is good to follow the angel of righteousness and to put yourself out of range of the angel of wickedness. This much this commandment makes clear about faith, that you may believe the deeds of the angel of righteousness and live to God by performing them. Believe that the deeds of the angel of wickedness are troublesome and, if you do not perform them, you will live to God. Chapter 12, The Seventh Mandate Fear the Lord and keep His commandments, he said. For by keeping God's commandments you will be powerful in every action and your actions will be beyond criticism. Therefore, fear the Lord and you will do everything well. This is the fear you must have to be saved. Do not fear the devil. By fearing the Lord you will gain the mastery over the devil for there is no power in him. For where there is no power, neither is there cause to fear. But there must be fear of him whose might is glorious. For everyone who has power inspires fear, but he who has no power is despised by all. However, fear the deeds of the devil, because they are evil. If you fear the Lord, you will fear the deeds of the devil. Do not perform them, but keep aloof from them. For there are two kinds of fear. If you wish to do evil, fear the Lord and you will not do it. So too, if you wish to do good, fear the Lord and you will do it. Consequently, the fear of the Lord is security, mighty and glorious. Therefore, fear the Lord and you will live to Him. All those who fear Him and keep His commandments will live to God. And I said, Sir, why do you say that those who observe his commandments, they will live to God? Because all creation fears the Lord, 
but not all keep his commandments. He said, But life with God is for those who both fear him and keep his commandments. There is no life for those who fail to keep his commandments. Chapter 13 The Eighth Mandate Then he said, I told you that God's creatures are twofold, for restraint also is twofold. For in some things we must restrain ourselves, and in others we do not. And I said, Sir, make known to me in what we must restrain ourselves, and in what we must not. I shall tell you, he said, Restrain yourself from evil, and do not do it. However, do not restrain yourself from good, but do it. For if you restrain yourself and keep from doing good, you commit a serious sin. But if you restrain yourself and abstain from doing evil, you achieve a great work of righteousness. Restrain yourself from all evil by doing good. Sir, what are the kinds of evil from which we must restrain ourselves? I said. I shall tell you, he said, from adultery and fornication, from uncontrolled drunkenness, from evil luxury, from excessive eating and extravagant wealth, from boastfulness, arrogance, and pride, from lying, backbiting, and hypocrisy, the remembrance of wrong, and all blasphemy. These deeds are the most evil in the life of all men. Therefore, a servant of God must restrain himself from such deeds. The person who does not cannot live to God. Now, let me tell you the consequences. Sir, are there any other evil deeds? I said. Yes, indeed. Many more which the servant of God must restrain himself from. Theft, lying, robbery, false witness, covetousness, lust, deceit, vain glory, pretense, and similar excesses. Do you not think such sins are wicked? Very wicked indeed for the servants of God, I said. A servant of God should restrain himself from all these excesses. Therefore, restrain yourself that you may live to God and be enrolled with those who restrain themselves in these matters. Therefore, these are the matters in which you should exercise self-restraint. He said, I shall now tell you from what you must not restrain yourself and what you ought to perform. Do not refrain from good, but do it. I said, Sir, also make clear to me the nature of good, that I may walk in it, and be subject to it, and by doing it may be saved. He answered, I shall also tell you the good deeds which you ought to perform and from which you are not to restrain yourself. He said, In the forefront are faith, fear of the Lord, love, concord, upright speech, truthfulness, patience. There is nothing superior to these in the life of men. If anyone keeps these virtues and does not restrain himself from them, he will be blessed in life. Let me also enumerate the consequent good actions. The assistance of widows, looking after orphans and the poor, ransoming God's servants from distress, showing hospitality, for benevolence is found in hospitality, never resisting anyone, being of a quiet disposition, having fewer needs than all men, honoring the aged, practicing righteousness, exercising fraternal charity, enduring insult, being long-suffering, abstaining from resentment, comforting those who are troubled in spirit, not rejecting those who have stumbled in the faith, but winning them back and encouraging them, admonishing sinners, not oppressing debtors and the poor, and if there are any other actions like these, 
Do you not think these acts are good? Sir, there is nothing better than such acts, I said. Then walk in them and do not hold back from them and you will live to God. He said, Observe this commandment. If you do good without restraint, you will live to God, and all who do likewise will live to God. So too, if you avoid doing evil and restrain yourself from it, you will live to God. And whoever observes these commandments and walks in them will also live to God. Chapter 14, The Ninth Mandate He said to me, Cast off indecision and do not be double-minded at all when asking anything from God. Do not say, How can I ask and receive anything from the Lord after having committed so many sins? Do not entertain such thoughts, but with your whole heart turn to the Lord and ask Him without doubting, and you will learn the abundance of His tender mercies. He will never leave you, no. He will fulfill the petition of your soul. For God is not like men who remember evils done against them. He does not remember evil and has mercy on what He has made. Therefore, cleanse your heart from all the vanities of this world and from the vices already mentioned. Then ask of the Lord and you will receive all, and none of your requests will be denied provided you ask the Lord without doubting. However, if you doubt in your heart, you will not receive a single one of your requests. The double-minded are those who doubt the Lord and altogether fail to obtain any of their requests. But those who are wholly perfect in the faith ask everything, trusting in the Lord, and they receive because they ask without doubting, without double-mindedness. Every double-minded man, even if he repents, will be saved only with difficulty. Therefore, cleanse your heart of double-mindedness. Clothe yourself with faith, because it is strong, and put your trust in God, confident that you will receive from Him all that you ask. And if at some time or other, after having made it, you receive your request from the Lord rather slowly, do not doubt because you are slower than you expected in obtaining the request of your soul. For invariably you receive your request slowly on account of some temptation or some sin of which you are not aware. Therefore do not cease from asking the request of your soul. But if you become discouraged and double-minded while asking, blame yourself and not the giver. Be on your guard against this double-mindedness for it is evil and senseless. It uproots many from the faith, however strong in faith they are. For double-mindedness is the daughter of the devil and is exceedingly wicked to the servants of God. Despise double-mindedness and gain the mastery of it in everything by clothing yourself with faith, which is strong and powerful. For faith promises all things, perfects all things, but double-mindedness, which does not even have confidence in itself, fails in all its works. Therefore you see that faith is from above from the Lord, and its power is great. Whereas double-mindedness is an earthly spirit from the devil lacking in power. He said, Therefore be subject to the faith that has power and keep aloof from double-mindedness, which lacks power and you will live to God as well as all who are of the same mind. Chapter 15 The Tenth Mandate Then he said, Remove grief from your heart, for it is a sister of double-mindedness and violent temper. Sir, how is it a sister of these two? I said. For it seems to me that violent temper is one thing, and double-mindedness another and grief still another. He said, You are a senseless man not to know that grief is more wicked than all spirits and most dangerous to servants of God. It is the most destructive of all the spirits of men and wears down the Holy Spirit, but, on the other hand, saves it. 
I am a man without understanding, and do not follow these parables, I said. I do not see how it can wear down and then, on the other hand, save. I shall tell you, he said. There are those who have never made deeper inquiry into the truth nor about God. They merely believe while they are embroiled in business, wealth, heathen friendships, and many other commitments of this world. Those who are intent on such matters fail to grasp the divine parables, for these occupations keep their minds in darkness. They are corrupted and become dried up. Even as good vineyards, when not cared for, grow barren with thorns and various weeds, so believers who become involved in the previously mentioned numerous occupations go astray in their understanding and are altogether without perception for righteousness. When they hear about divine things and truth, their mind is taken up with their business and they understand absolutely nothing. It is different with those who have the fear of God and make inquiry into divine things and truth with hearts directed to the Lord. They understand more quickly what is told to them and penetrate its meaning, because they have the fear of the Lord. For wherever the Lord dwells, there also is much understanding. Adhere to the Lord, and you will grasp and understand all things. Let me tell you now, slow-witted man, how grief wears down the Holy Spirit and again saves it. When the double-minded man applies himself to any practice and fails in it because of his double-mindedness, this grief enters into him and grieves the Holy Spirit and wears it down. So also, when violent temper clings to the man in regard to any matter, he is very much embittered and grief enters the heart of the violent-tempered man. He is then distressed at the action he performed and repents because he did evil. Now, this grief seems to bring salvation because he repents of having done evil. Therefore, both deeds grieve the spirit. The double-mindedness, because he has not succeeded in the action itself, and the violent temper, because he committed evil. The two, then, double-mindedness and violent temper, are grieving to the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Remove grief and do not oppress the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, lest it will entreat God to depart from you. For the Spirit of God that was given to this flesh does not endure grief and confinement. Clothe yourself with cheerfulness, which always finds favor with God and is acceptable to Him. Rejoice in it. For every cheerful man does good, has good thoughts, and despises grief. On the other hand, the grieved man is always committing sin. In the first place, he commits sin because he brings grief to the Holy Spirit that was given to man as a spirit of gladness. In the second place, by grieving the Holy Spirit, he commits iniquity, neither interceding nor confessing to God. The prayer of a grieved man has no power at all to ascend to the altar of God. Why does the entreaty of the grieved man not ascend to the altar of God? I said. Because grief resides in his heart. Consequently, the grief mingles with his entreaty and does not permit his prayer to ascend pure to the altar. Just as vinegar mixed with wine in the same vessel does not yield the same agreeable taste as wine alone gives, so also Grief mixed with the Holy Spirit does not yield the same power of impenetration as would be produced by the Holy Spirit alone. Therefore, cleanse yourself of this wicked grief and you will live to God. And all will live to God who cast away grief and clothe themselves in complete cheerfulness. Chapter 16 The Eleventh Mandate he pointed out to me men sitting on a bench, and another man sitting on a chair. He said to me, Do you see the men sitting on the bench? Yes, sir, I replied. 
He said, These men are the faithful. And the man sitting on the chair is a false prophet who corrupts the understanding of God's servants. However, he corrupts the understanding of those who are double-minded, not of the faithful. These double-minded men then come to him as to a soothsayer and ask him about their future. That false prophet, having no power from a divine spirit within himself, then speaks with them along the lines of their questions in accordance with their evil desires and fills their souls with expectations according to their own wishes. Empty as he is, it is empty answers that he gives to the empty. For whatever inquiry is made, his answer is directed to the emptiness of that man. However, some of the words he utters are true, for the devil fills him with his own spirit to see whether he can break down one of the righteous. Therefore, those who are strong in the faith of the Lord clothe themselves with truth and do not adhere to this kind of spirit. No, they keep at a distance from such spirits. But those who are double-minded and repent frequently consult fortune tellers like the heathen and bring a greater sin upon themselves with their idolatry. For the one who consults a false prophet about any situation is an idolater, empty of truth and stupid. For no spirit granted by God requires to be asked, but such a spirit, having the power of divinity, speaks everything on its own accord because it is from above. But the spirit which is asked and speaks according to the desires of men is earthly and weak, without any power, and it is altogether silent unless it is questioned. I said, Sir, how is a man to know which of them is a prophet and which is a false prophet? He said, I shall tell you about both prophets, and then you can test the true and the false prophet according to my directions. Test a man who has the divine spirit by his life. First, the man who has the spirit from above is meek, tranquil, humble. He abstains from all wickedness and vain desires of this world and contents himself with fewer wants than those of all men. When asked, he makes no reply, nor does he speak privately. Neither does the Holy Spirit speak when a man wishes it to speak, but he speaks only when God wishes him to speak. When a man who has the divine spirit enters an assembly of righteous men who have faith in God's spirit, and an entreaty is addressed to God by such an assembly, at that moment the angel of the prophetic spirit who rests upon this man fills him. And being filled with the Holy Spirit, he speaks to the assembly in accordance with the Lord's wishes. Thus, in this manner, the divine spirit will be made clear. Therefore, this is the power of the Lord's divine spirit. Then he said, now I shall tell you about the earthly spirit that is inane, powerless, and truly foolish. First, the man who thinks he has a spirit exalts himself and wishes to have the seat of honor. Immediately he is reckless, impudent, indulges in considerable luxury and in many other deceits. He also takes pay for his prophecy and makes no prophecy unless he receives it. Can the Divine Spirit receive money for prophesying? It is impossible for a prophet of God to do this, but prophets of this character are possessed by an earthly spirit. Furthermore, it does not approach assemblies of righteous men at all, but shuns them. It clings to the double-minded and to the vain, making prophecies to them in a corner, deceiving them by speaking in accordance with their lusts all in empty fashion for it is answering empty people. For the empty vessel, when placed with other empty vessels, does not break, but they correspond to each other. Now, when he comes to an assembly filled with righteous men who have the divine spirit, such a man is emptied after their prayer of petition, and the earthly spirit in fear takes flight from him, and he is struck dumb, completely shattered, without the power to speak a thing. For if you stack wine and oil into a cellar and place an empty jar among the rest, when you wish to unstack the cellar, 
you will find the one you placed there just as empty. In the same way, also, vacuous prophets, after going in amongst the souls of righteous men, they are found to be exactly the same as when they came in. The life of the two kinds of prophets has just been given to you. Therefore, test the man who claims inspiration by his life and his actions. But you, put your faith in the spirit that comes from God and has power. Put no faith in the earthly, empty spirit, because there is no power in him. He comes from the devil. Listen to the parable I'm going to tell you. Pick up a stone and throw it up and see whether you can touch the heavens. Or again, take a syringe full of water and squirt up to the heavens and see whether you can penetrate through. Sir, how can this be done? I said. Both actions you have just said are... impossible. Just as these are impossible, so too are the earthly spirits powerless and feeble, he said. Now, compare the power that comes from above. A hailstone is quite a small missile, but when it falls on a man's head, what a pain it causes. Or again, take the drop which falls from a roof tile to the ground, and yet it hollows a stone. So you see that the smallest objects falling from above have great power. Thus also is the Divine Spirit that comes from above powerful. Put your trust then in this Spirit, but have nothing to do with the other. Chapter 17 The Twelfth Mandate He said to me, Put away every evil desire and clothe yourself with good and holy desire. For if you are clothed with this good desire, you will hate the evil desire and bridle it as you please. For evil desire is fierce and difficult to tame. It is fearsome, and its ferocity wastes men. In particular, if a servant of God becomes entangled in it and has no prudence, it works dreadful havoc with him. But it costs a heavy price to those who do not have the cloak of good desire and are engrossed with this world. Such men it hands over to death. Sir, what are the works of evil desire which hand a man over to death? I said, tell me, so that I may keep away from them. He said, listen then to the works in which evil desire brings death to the servants of God. Foremost of all is the desire for another man's wife or another wife's husband, the desire of profuse wealth, of many useless foods and drinks, and of numerous other foolish luxuries. For every luxury is foolish and empty for the servant of God. Therefore, such desires are evil and death-dealing to the servants of God. An evil desire of this kind is the daughter of the devil. Therefore, one must abstain from evil desires, and by abstention you all may live to God. But as many as are overpowered by them and do not resist them will finally perish, since these desires are deadly. As for you, put on the desire of righteousness, and armed with the fear of the Lord, resist them. For fear of the Lord has its dwelling in good desire. If evil desire sees you armed with the fear of God in resisting, it will flee far away and you will not set eyes on it, because it fears your arms. Therefore, after receiving the crown for your victory against evil desire, advance to the desire of righteousness and attribute the victory to this. Serve the wishes of righteousness. If you serve and are subject to good desire, you will be able to master evil desire and hold it in subjection as you please. I said, Sir, I should like to know how I ought to serve good desire. I shall tell you, he said. Practice righteousness and virtue, truthfulness and fear of the Lord, faith, meekness, 
and all similar good acts. By doing this, you will be a pleasing servant of God and will live to Him. And everyone who are servants of good desires will live to God. Chapter 18, Conclusion to the Mandates With this, he finished the twelve mandates. He then said to me, These are the mandates. Walk in them and exhort those who hear you that their repentance may be clean for the rest of their days. Fulfill the ministry I have given you with utmost care and work hard, for you will find favor with those who are going to repent, and they will obey your words. For I shall be on your side and will compel them to obey you. I said to him, Sir, these mandates are great, good, and glorious, and capable of gladdening the heart of the man who is able to observe them. But I do not know whether these mandates can be kept by men, because they are exceedingly hard. In answer he said to me, If you persuade yourself that they can be observed, you will do so easily and they will not be hard. But if you come to imagine that they cannot be observed by a man, you will not observe them. For now I tell you, if you do not observe them but neglect them, neither you nor your children nor your household will have salvation, since you have passed judgment on yourself by the impossibility for a man to observe these mandates. He said this with such excessive anger that I was confounded and very much afraid of him. For his appearance had so changed that no man could stand up against his anger. On seeing my utter distress and confusion, he began to address me more gently and cheerfully in these words. Foolish man, without understanding and of a double-minded heart. You do not realize how great, strong, and marvelous is the glory of God. It was for man that he created the world and it is to man that he has subjected all his creation, giving him the mastery over everything that is under the heavens. He said, Now, if man is the master of all the creatures of God and rules over all, certainly he can acquire mastery of these mandates. For the man who has the Lord in his heart can master all things and all these mandates. He said, But those who have the Lord on their lips, while their heart is hardened, who are in fact far from the Lord. For them these mandates are difficult and cumbersome. Therefore, all of you who are empty and fickle in the faith, put the Lord in your hearts and then you will know that nothing is easier, sweeter, or more gentle than these mandates. Be converted, you who walk in the commandments of the devil, commandments that are hard, bitter, cruel, and foul. And do not fear the devil either, because he has no power against you. I, the angel of repentance, who have overcome the devil, am on your side. The devil only causes fear, but his fear is of no consequence. Therefore, do not fear him, and he will flee from you. I said to him, Sir, let me say a few words. Say what you please. He answered. I said, Sir, a man is eager to keep God's commandments, and there is not one who does not entreat the Lord to be strengthened in his commandments and to submit to them. But the devil is harsh and lords it over them. The devil cannot lord it over the servants of God who hope in him with their whole heart. The devil can wrestle with but not overcome them. Therefore, if you resist him, he will flee from you in defeat and disgrace. He said, But empty men fear him as if he had power. When a man fills an ample number of jars with good wine, and among these jars there are a few half empty, he does not pay attention to the full ones when he comes to his wine jugs, because he knows that they are full. But he is concerned lest the empty ones have turned sour, because empty jars quickly turn sour and the wine's good taste is lost. 
In the same way, the devil comes and tempts all the servants of God. Those who are strong in the faith resist him, and he goes away from them, because he cannot find entrance. Therefore, he then goes to the empty and, finding room to enter, accomplishes in them whatever he pleases and makes them his slaves. I, the angel of repentance, am telling all of you, do not fear the devil, he said, for I have been sent to be on the side of you who repent with your whole heart and to steady you in the faith. Put your faith in God, you who despair of your life because of your sins, you who add to your sins and make your life burdensome. Trust that if you turn to the Lord with your whole heart and do righteousness for the rest of your life, serving Him uprightly in accordance with His will, He will provide a remedy for your previous failings and you will be empowered to master the devil's snares. Do not be in the least afraid of the devil's threats, for they are as powerless as a dead man's sinews. Listen to me. Fear the one who has power to save and to destroy. Keep all the mandates and you will live to God. I said to him, Sir, I have now gained strength in all the justifications of the Lord, because you are on my side. I know that you will break down all the devil's power, and we shall have the mastery over him, and overcome all his snares. Sir, I now hope, with the Lord's help, to be able to keep these mandates you have given. He said, you will keep them if your heart is made pure to the Lord. Also, all those who cleanse their hearts of the vain desires of this world will keep them and will live to God. Chapter 19 The First Parable He said to me, all of you know that you who are servants of God are living in a foreign country, for your city is far away from this city. Now, if you know your own city in which you are to dwell, why do you secure fields, rich establishments, houses, and superfluous dwellings? He who secures such things in this foreign city does not think of returning to his true city. O foolish, miserable, double-minded man, do you not realize that these superfluities belong to another and are under the control of another? For the Lord of this foreign city will say, I do not wish for you to reside in my city. Depart from it, for you do not live according to my laws. Therefore, if you have fields, dwellings, and other possessions, what will you do with your field, your house, and the rest of your accumulations if you are cast out by him. The Lord of this foreign country will justly tell you, either live according to my laws or leave my country. What are you going to do then, since you are subject to the law of your own city? Are you going to, for the sake of your fields and the rest of your belongings, altogether renounce your own proper law and walk according to the law of this foreign city? Take care, lest it may be against your advantage to renounce your law. You may not be received if you wish to return to your city, because you have denied the law of your city and it will be shut to you. Therefore, you must be careful while living in a foreign land not to acquire a bit more than an adequate sufficiency. Be prepared so that when the ruler of this foreign city wishes to expel you for resisting his law, you may come out of his city and enter your own and there rejoice without insolence in the observance of your own proper law. Therefore, all of you who serve God, be on your guard and hold him in your heart. Keep in mind the commandments of God and the promises he made and do his works. Be confident that he will fulfill his promises if his commandments are kept. Therefore, instead of fields, buy souls that are in trouble, 
according as each one is able. Look after widows and orphans, and do not neglect them. Spend your riches and all your establishments you have received from God on these kinds of fields and houses. It was for this that the Master bestowed wealth on you, to perform this ministry for Him. It is far better to buy such lands and possessions and houses, for you will find them when you settle in your own city. Such lavishness is good and cheerful, is free from grief and fear, full of joy. Do not perform the philanthropies of the heathen. They are of no use for any of you servants of God. Instead, be lavish in your own special way which can give you joy. Do not counterfeit, do not lay hand on what belongs to another, and do not covet his possessions, for it is wicked to covet another man's possessions. Work your own work, and you will be saved. Chapter 20 The Second Parable As I was walking in the country, I observed an elm and a vine, and compared them and their fruits. The shepherd appeared and said to me, What are you thinking within yourself? I am thinking about the elm and the vine, I said. They are very well adapted to one another. These two trees are a symbol for the servants of God, he said. I would like to know what type these trees you mention represent, I said. You have the elm and the vine before your eyes? He said. Yes, sir. I answered. This vine bears fruit, but the elm is sterile, he said. But this vine cannot bear fruit unless it climbs up the elm. Otherwise it spreads all over the ground. And if it does bear, the fruit is rotten, because it has not been hanging from the elm. Therefore, when the vine has been attached to the elm, it bears fruit both from itself and from the elm. So you see that the elm also yields fruit, not a bit less than the vine, but rather more. How does it yield more, sir? I said. And he said, Because the vine that is hanging on the elm yields copious and sound fruit. But, if it is spread on the ground, it bears rotten fruit and little of it. Therefore, this parable applies to all the servants of God, to both the poor as well as the rich. Sir, I said, how is this the parable of the rich and the poor? Let me know. I shall tell you, he answered. The rich man has great wealth, but as far as the Lord is concerned, he is poor because he is distracted by his wealth. His confession, his prayer to the Lord is very limited. That which he makes is insignificant and weak and has no power above. But when a rich man helps a poor man and assists him in his needs, he has the assurance that what he does for the poor man can procure a reward from God. For the poor man is rich in intercession and confession, and his intercession has great power with God. Therefore the rich man does not hesitate to supply the poor man with everything. On the other hand, the poor man who has been helped by the rich intercedes for him and gives thanks to God for his benefactor. And the latter is constantly solicitous for the poor man, so that he may not be in want during his life, because he knows that the poor man's intercession is acceptable and rich in God's sight. Both fulfill their function in this way. The poor man makes intercession, a work in which he is rich, which he received from the Lord and returns it to the Lord who supplies him. In the same way, the rich man, without hesitation, puts the riches he received from the Lord at the disposal of the poor. This is a great and acceptable work in the sight of God. For the rich man has understanding in his riches, and has used the bounties of the Lord on the poor man's behalf, and rightly accomplishes the Lord's ministry. From men's point of view, the elm seems not to bear fruit. But they do not know or understand that in case of a drought, the elm holds water and nourishes the vine. 
and so the vine with an uninterrupted supply of water yields double the amount of fruit, both for itself and for the elm. In the same way, the poor who intercede with the Lord on behalf of the rich increase their riches, while the rich, by supplying the needs of the poor, make up for the shortcomings of their souls. In this way, both become associates in the righteous work. Therefore, by doing this, you will not be deserted by God. No, you will be inscribed in the books of the living. Blessed are those who possess such riches and understand that riches are from the Lord. For those who understand this will be able to do some good deed. Chapter 21, The Third Parable He showed me many leafless trees that seemed to me to be withered and all alike. And he said to me, Do you see these trees? Yes, sir, I do, I said. They are all dry and of the same kind. In answer, he said, The trees you see are the people living in this world. I said, Why are they all dry and alike? He said, Because in this world, neither the righteous nor sinners are visibly distinguishable, but they are alike. For this world is winter for the righteous, and they are not visibly distinguishable, because they dwell with sinners. For just as in winter, trees that have shed their leaves are alike and cannot be determined which are dry and which are living. So too, in this world, neither the righteous nor sinners can be visibly distinguished, but all are alike one to another. Chapter 22, The Fourth Parable Once more he showed me trees, some in bloom and some shriveled. And he said to me, Do you see these trees? Yes, sir, I said. I see some in bloom and some shriveled. Those that are in bloom are the righteous, who are about to live in the world that is coming, he said. For the world to come is summer for the righteous, but it is winter for sinners. When the Lord's mercy shines forth, then the servants of God will be visibly distinguished. So all will be visibly distinguishable. Just as in summer, the fruits of every single tree come to light and we recognize them by their kind, so will the fruits of the righteous be visibly distinguished and it will be known that all are flourishing in that world. Heathen and sinners, the dry trees you see, will be found to be dry and fruitless in that world. They will be burned as firewood and will be visibly distinguished because their activity in life was wicked. Sinners will be burned because they sinned without repenting, heathen because they did not know their Creator. Therefore, bear fruit so that your fruit may be known in that summer. Keep away from numerous occupations and you will not commit sin. For those who are engaged in multiple occupations also sin much, because they are distracted by their occupations and fail to serve their Lord. How can such a person ask and obtain anything from the Lord without serving the Lord? He said. His servants are those who will obtain but those who do not serve the Lord will not obtain their requests. However, if a person is occupied with only one business, he can also serve the Lord. For his heart will not be corrupted and turned aside from the Lord. He will still serve him by keeping a pure heart. By doing this, you will be able to bear fruit for the world to come. So will everyone who does the same. Chapter 23, The Fifth Parable While I was fasting, seated on a certain mountain, and giving thanks to the Lord for everything He had done to me, I saw the shepherd, seated beside me, saying to me, Why have you come here so early in the morning? Because I am keeping a station, sir, I said. What is the station? 
he said. I am fasting, sir, I said. What is this fast that all of you are engaged in? He said. I fast, sir, as I am accustomed, I said. You do not know how to fast to the Lord, he said. And this unprofitable fast you keep for him is no fast at all. Why do you say this, sir? I said. I declare that this is not a fast as you think it is, he said. I shall teach you what is a fast complete and acceptable to the Lord. Yes, sir, I said. You will render me fortunate to know the kind of fast that is acceptable to God. Pay attention, he said. God does not wish vain fasting of this kind. When you fast in this way, for God's sake, you accomplish nothing for righteousness. Here is the fast you must keep for God. Do not commit any wicked deed in your life and serve the Lord with a pure heart. Keep His commandments by walking according to His regulations and do not let any evil desire arise in your heart and have faith in God. If you do this and fear Him and refrain from every evil act, you will live to God. And by doing this, you will also perform a fast that is great and acceptable to God. Let me tell you the parable I have in mind relative to fasting. A certain man had a field and numerous slaves. In one part of the field he planted a vineyard. Then he chose a slave who was dependable, respectable, and honest, summoned him and said, Take this vineyard I planted and fence it in. Until I come, do nothing else to the vineyard. Do this and you will receive from me your freedom. Then the master of that slave went off to a foreign country. When he had left, the slave took the vineyard and fenced it in. After finishing it, he noticed that the vineyard was full of weeds. He thought the matter over to himself and said, I have done what my master ordered. Next, I shall dig this vineyard. It will look better after having been dug. Without weeds it will yield more fruit, since the fruit will not be choked by weeds. So he went and dug the vineyard and plucked up all the weeds that were in it. Then the vineyard became very beautiful and flourishing without any weeds to choke it. After a while, the master of the slave and of the field returned to his vineyard. When he saw that the vineyard had been fenced in properly and, over and above this, had been dug and cleared of weeds and that the vines were flourishing, he was exceedingly glad at the work of his slave. So he summoned his beloved son, who was his heir, and his friends, who were his advisors, and told them what he had ordered his slave to do and what he found. And they also rejoiced along with the slave at the testimony given by the master. The latter said to them, I promised freedom to this slave if he observed the order which I gave him. He has kept my order, and, besides to my great pleasure, he has done a good work in the vineyards. So. As a reward for this, I wish to make him joint heir with my son, because when the good thought came, he did not neglect it, but put it into execution. The son of the master was pleased with this intention, that the slave should be joint heir with the son. A few days later, his master had a banquet and sent his slave many dainties from the feast. From the dainties sent to him by his master, the slave only took what was sufficient for himself and distributed the remainder to his fellow slaves. Then the fellow slaves, in their joy at receiving the dainties, began interceding on his behalf that he might find even greater favor with his master for having treated them so well. All these things his master heard and once more was exceedingly pleased with his conduct. So the master called together his friends once more and his son and let them know what the slave had done with the dainties he had received. Those who had been called together were all the more pleased that he should be joint heir with the son. I said, Sir, I do not know these parables and cannot understand them unless you explain them to me. 
I shall explain everything to you, he said, and whatever I tell you, I shall make clear to you. Keep the commandments of the Lord and you will be approved. You will be inscribed among the number of those who keep his commandments. But if you do any good over and above what is commanded by God, you will acquire more abundant glory and will be held in that much greater honor in the sight of God than you would be otherwise. Therefore, if you also perform these additional services while keeping God's commandments, joy will be yours provided you observe them in accordance with my commandments. I said to him, Sir, whatever command you give, I shall observe, for I know that you are on my side. I shall be on your side, because you are zealous in doing good, he said. I shall also be on the side of all who have the same zeal. This fasting, which consists in the observance of the commandments of the Lord, is very beautiful. He said, This is the way to keep the fast you intend to observe. Before anything else, abstain from every wicked word and every evil desire and purify your heart of all the vanities of this world. If you observe this, your fast will be perfect. Act as follows. After having done what is prescribed on the day of your fast, do not taste anything except bread and water. Compute the total expense for the food you would have eaten on the day on which you intended to keep a fast, and you will give it to a widow, an orphan, or someone in need. In this way you will become humble in soul, so that the beneficiary of your humility may fill his soul and intercede to the Lord for you. Therefore, if you perform your fasting in the way I have commanded, your sacrifice will be acceptable in the sight of God, and this fast will be written down. And the service performed in this way is beautiful, joyous, and acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Observe these things in the manner explained, together with your children and your whole household. And if you observe them, you will be blessed, and all those who hear and observe these things will also be blessed, and whatever they ask from the Lord, they will receive. I urgently asked him to explain the parable of the field, the master, the vineyard, the slave fencing in the vineyard, the fences, the weeds plucked out from the vineyard, the sun, and the friendly advisers. For I understood that all this was a parable. He answered and said, You are exceedingly persistent in your questions. You do not have to ask anything at all, for if there is need of explanation, it will be given you. I said to him, Sir, if you do not explain what you show me, there is no purpose in having seen it, since I do not understand what it means. Every time you tell me parables without giving me the key to them, I shall be listening in vain. He answered me again and said, Whoever is a servant of God and has the Lord in his heart asks for understanding and receives it. He has the key to every parable and the words of the Lord told to him in parables become known. But those who are weak and sluggish in prayer hesitate to ask anything from the Lord. But the Lord is full of compassion and gives to those who make their petition without ceasing. Why do you not ask and receive understanding from the Lord? You have been strengthened by the holy angel. You have received from so many intercessions and you are not sluggish. So ask of the Lord and you will receive understanding. I said to him, Sir, since you are with me, I must ask and question you, for you show me everything, and now you are speaking with me. If I had seen and heard these things without you, I would ask the Lord to make it clear to me. He said, I have just told you that you are shrewd and obstinate in asking for explanations of the parables. Since you are so persistent, I shall elucidate for you the parable of the field and all the other points that follow, so you can make them known to everyone. Listen and understand this, 
he said. The field is this world. The Lord of the field is the one who has created everything and fitted things together and given them strength. The slave is the son of God, while the vines are the people he engendered. The fences are the holy angels of the Lord who sustain his people. The weeds plucked from the vineyard are iniquities of the servants of God. The food he sent are the commandments which he gave to his people through his Son. The friends and advisors are the holy angels who were created first. The departure of the master for a foreign land is the time remaining until his coming. I said to him, Sir, all this is marvelous, great, and glorious. Then I said, Truly, I could not have understood this. There is not a single man, no matter how clever he is, who is capable of understanding this. Once more, sir, explain to me what I am about to ask, I said. Ask whatever you please, he said. Why is the Son of God represented in the form of a slave in the parable? I said. Listen, he said. The Son of God is not represented in the form of a slave, but is represented with great power and majesty. How is that? I said. I do not understand. And he said. Because God planted the vineyard, that is to say, he created the people and gave them over to his son. The son appointed the angels to watch over them. He himself purified their sins by undergoing innumerable toils and labors, for no one is able to dig without toil and labor. By purging away their sins in person, he showed them the ways of life and gave them the law which he received from his father. Then he said, So you see that he is Lord of his people, because he has received all authority from his Father. Now, let me tell you why the Lord took his Son and the glorious angels as advisors in the question of the slave's inheritance. The Holy Spirit, the pre-existent, the creator of all creations, was made by God to dwell in the chosen flesh. Therefore, this flesh, in which the Holy Spirit dwelt, was beautifully subject to the Spirit, and walked in holiness and purity, and defiled the Spirit in absolutely nothing. Therefore, the flesh was guided with beauty and purity by the Spirit, and shared his toil and labor in everything. Because the flesh had conducted itself with strength and courage, he associated it with the Holy Spirit, for he was pleased with the career of this flesh, which had not been defiled while holding the Spirit on earth. Therefore, he took the Son and the glorious angels as advisors, in order that the flesh, which blamelessly subjected itself to the Spirit, might have some place of abode and might not appear to have lost the reward of its service. For all flesh that has been found without spot or defilement in which the Holy Spirit has had his abode, will receive a reward. Here you have the solution of this parable. I am delighted, sir, to have heard this explanation, I said. Let me tell you further, he said. Keep this flesh of yours pure and undefiled, in order that the Holy Spirit which dwells within may give testimony to it and your flesh may be justified. Make sure that the thought never arises in your heart that this flesh of yours is perishable and that you misuse it by any act of defilement. For if you defile your flesh, you also defile the Holy Spirit. And if you defile your flesh, you will not live. I said, If prior to having heard these words there was some ignorance, how can a man who has defiled his flesh be saved? A remedy for previous ignorance is only possible for God, for he has all power, he said. But for now, 
preserve yourself, and the omnipotent Lord in His great mercy will grant a remedy for former transgressions. From now on, defile neither flesh nor spirit, for the two are associates, and one cannot be defiled without the other. Therefore, keep both pure and you will live to God. Chapter 24 The Sixth Parable While seated in my house and praising the Lord for all I had seen, I also meditated on how the mandates were noble, possible of fulfillment, joyous, glorious, and capable of saving a man's soul. So I said to myself, I shall be blessed if I walk in these mandates, and so will anyone be who walks in them. As I was saying this to myself, I suddenly saw him seated beside me. He said to me, Why are you entertaining double-mindedness about the mandates I gave to you? They are beautiful. Cast aside all double-mindedness, clothe yourself with faith in the Lord, and walk in them, for I shall give you strength to keep them. These mandates are advantageous for those who intend to repent. For, if they do not walk in them, their repentance is worthless. So all of you who repent must cast off the wickedness of this world which wears you down. If you put on every excellence of righteousness, you will be able to observe these mandates and keep from committing any additional sins. For if you do not add to your former sins, you will eliminate many of your former sins. Therefore. Walk in these mandates, and you will live to God. All this I have told you. After telling me this, he said, Let us go into the field, and I shall show you the shepherds of the sheep. Yes, sir, I said, let us go. On coming to a certain field, he pointed out to me a young shepherd, clothed in a suit of saffron-colored garments. He was tending an extremely large number of sheep, who were apparently well-fed and frisky and frolicking joyously here and there. The shepherd himself was merry with his flock, and his whole appearance was joyous as he ran about among his sheep. He said to me, Do you see the shepherd? Yes, sir, I said. This is the angel of luxury and deceit, he said. He wears down the souls of God's servants who are empty and makes them turn away from the truth by deceiving them with evil desires through which they will perish. Consequently, they forget the commandments of the living God and walk in deceits and vain luxury. Thus, they are sent to destruction by this angel, some to death, some to corruption. I said to him, Sir, I do not know what this means death, and corruption. I shall tell you, he said. The sheep you see joyously frolicking are those who have been completely drawn away from God and have surrendered themselves to the lusts of this world. For in these there is no repentance unto life, because they are blaspheming the name of God. Therefore their life is death. And the sheep you see not frolicking, but standing in one place and grazing, are those who have given themselves up to luxury and deceit, but have not blasphemed the Lord. These are those, then, who have been led away from the truth. There is hope of repentance for them, and so of life. For their perversion holds some hope of renovation, but death means everlasting ruin. Once more we went on a little further, and he pointed out to me a shepherd, large and quite savage in appearance. He was dressed in white goatskin, with a bag on his shoulders. In his hands was a very rough staff, with knots in it, and a whip. His look was so severe that I was afraid of him. This shepherd was constantly receiving sheep from a young shepherd, those that were frisky and well-fed, but not frolicking about. 
and he threw them into a place that was steep and full of thorns and thistles, so that the sheep could not distangle themselves from the thorns and thistles, but became entangled in them. These sheep, entangled in the thorns and thistles, were very miserable, because they were being beaten by him. Though they were driven here and there, he gave them no rest. They could not lie down at ease anywhere at all. When I saw them whipped like this, and in misery, I was sorry for them, because they were so tormented without any respite whatever. I said to the shepherd who was talking to me, Sir, who is this heartless and savage shepherd? so utterly devoid of pity for these sheep. He is the angel of punishment, one of the righteous angels entrusted with punishment, he said. He takes those who have wandered away from God and have walked in the lusts and deceits of this world and chastises them as they deserve with diverse and dreadful punishments. Sir, I would like to know what these very punishments are, I said. I shall tell you, he said. The tortures and punishments are temporal, for some are punished with losses, some by poverty, some by various types of sicknesses, some by all kinds of disorder and confusion, some from the insults of unworthy people and sufferings of all kinds. For many people who are unsettled in their plans set their hands at many things, but nothing at all prospers for them. They say that they are not doing well in their pursuits, but it does not enter their heart that they have committed wicked deeds. Instead, they blame the Lord. When they have suffered every affliction, they are handed over to me for sound instruction. Then they are strengthened in the faith of the Lord, and for the rest of the days of their life, they serve the Lord with a pure heart. Now, when they repent, they recall the evil deeds that they committed, and at that point they praise God. They declare that God is a righteous judge, knowing that they each have suffered according to the measure of their own deeds. For the rest of the days of their life, they serve the Lord with pure hearts and prosper in their pursuits, receiving from the Lord whatever they ask for. Then, too, they praise the Lord for having been handed over to me and never again suffer any evil. I said to him, Sir, explain one more thing to me. What is your question? He said. I said, Sir, are those who live in luxury and deceit tortured for the same length of time as they lived in luxury and deceit? Yes, they are tortured for the same time. He said. I said, Sir, they are put to the torture a very short time. They ought to be tortured seven times as long for living in luxury and forgetting God as they do. He said to me, You are foolish and do not understand the power of the torture. If I did understand, sir, I would not have asked you to explain it to me, I said. Let me tell you the power of the two. The time of luxury and deceit is one hour. But the hour of torture is the equivalent of 30 days. So if anyone luxuriates himself or allows himself to be deceived for a single day, a single day's torture has the effectiveness of a whole year. Therefore, a man is tortured for as many years as there were days of luxury. Then he said, So you see that, though the period of luxury and deceit is very short, the period of punishment and torture is protracted. Sir, I said, I still do not fully understand about the period of deceit and luxury, and the period of torture. Give me a clearer explanation. In answer he said to me, Your foolishness is persistent, and you do not wish to purify your heart and serve God. Then he said, Take care, lest the time be fulfilled and it should be found that you are foolish. Then he said, 
Let me tell you then, that you may understand as you wish. The man who indulges in luxury and is deceived for a single day who does what he pleases is clothed in considerable foolishness without realizing his performance. The next day he forgets what he did the day before. For luxury and deceit have no memory because of that foolishness in which they are clothed. But when punishment and torture are imposed on a man for a single day, it is as punishment and torture for a whole year. For punishment and torture have long memories. Therefore, the man who is punished and tortured for a whole year finally remembers his luxury and deceit and he knows that he suffers evil for that reason. Consequently, every luxurious and deceived man is tortured in this way because, though he had life, he gave himself over to death. What kinds of luxuries are harmful, sir? I said. Every act performed with pleasure is luxurious for man. He said. For example, the sharp-tempered man by gratifying his passion is luxurious. Likewise the adulterer, the drunkard, the slanderer, the liar, the envious, the robber, and anyone who commits similar sins gives free rein to his peculiar vice. Consequently, he is luxurious in his action. All these acts of luxury are harmful to God's servants. Therefore, it is on account of these deceits that those who are punished and tortured suffer. However, there are acts of luxury that bring salvation to men. For there are many people who are luxurious in their good actions who are carried away by the pleasure this gives them. Therefore, this kind of luxury is advantageous for God's servants and secures life for this type of man. Whereas the injurious luxury mentioned before brings them punishment and torture, and if they persist without repenting, they bring death on themselves. Chapter 25 The Seventh Parable After a few days I saw him in the same plain where I had also seen the shepherds. And he asked me, What are you looking for? And I said, I am here, sir, to have you command the angel of punishment to leave my house, because he is afflicting me greatly. It is necessary for you to be afflicted, he said. Such is the injunction of the glorious angel concerning you, for he wants you to be put to the test. What have I done, sir, that is so wicked that I must be handed over to this angel, I said. I shall tell you, he said. Your sins are numerous, but not so numerous that you must be handed over to this angel. But your household has committed many sins and iniquities, and the glorious angel is embittered at their deeds. For this reason, he has given orders that you should be afflicted for a time, so that they also may repent and purify themselves of every lust of this world. When they repent and are purified, then the angel of punishment will depart from you. I said to him, Sir, even if they have committed acts to embitter the glorious angel, what have I done? He said, They cannot be afflicted in any other way unless you, the head of the whole household, suffer affliction. For if you suffer affliction, they also will necessarily be afflicted. But if you fare well, they suffer no affliction at all. I said, But look, sir, they have repented with their whole heart. I also know that they have repented with their whole heart, he said. But do you think that the sins of the repentant are immediately remissed? No, not completely. The one who repents must torture his soul and be thoroughly humbled in all his actions, and be afflicted in a variety of ways. If he endures the afflictions that come to him, the one who created all things and empowered them will surely have complete mercy and grant a remedy. God will do this when he sees the penitent's heart free from all wickedness. But 
It is to the advantage of you and your household that you be afflicted now. What more must I say to you? You must be afflicted in accordance with the orders of that angel of the Lord who handed you over to me. But also give thanks to the Lord for considering you worthy to have your affliction explained to you beforehand, so that by knowing it in advance, you will endure it with fortitude. I said to him, Sir, be on my side, and I shall be able to endure every affliction. I shall be on your side, he said, and I shall also ask the angel of punishment to send you milder afflictions. But you must be afflicted for a short time, and then you will be reestablished in your house. Only continue in your humble service of the Lord with a completely pure heart, you and your children and your household. Walk in the commandments I have given you, and it will be possible for your repentance to be deep and pure. And if you observe these commandments, together with your whole house, all affliction will pass from you. So will it also pass from all who walk in these commandments of mine. He said, Chapter 26, The Eighth Parable He showed me an ample willow, shading plains and mountains. And all those called by the name of the Lord assembled in its shade. The glorious, exceedingly tall angel of the Lord stood by the willow with a mighty pruning sickle. He was lopping off branches and distributing them to the people in the shade of the willow. He also distributed small rods, about one cubit long. After everyone had received rods, the angel put aside his sickle, yet the tree was as sound as when I had first seen it. I marveled at this to myself and said, How can the tree be sound? after so many branches have been lopped from it. The shepherd said to me, Do not be surprised that the tree remains sound after so many branches have been lopped from it. But wait, and when you have seen everything, then the meaning will be made clear to you. The angel who had distributed the rods asked for them back from them. In the order in which they had received the rods, they were summoned to him, and each one of them returned his rod to him. The angel of the Lord received them and scrutinized them carefully. From some, he received back rods dry and apparently worm-eaten. He ordered those who had returned such rods to stand apart. Others returned rods that were dry, but not worm-eaten. These people he also ordered to stand aside. Others returned rods that were half dry, and they stood at the side. Another group returned rods that were half dry, with cracks in them, and they stood apart. Another class gave up rods green and cracked, and stood apart. Others brought him rods two-thirds green and one-third dry, and stood apart. Others returned rods two-thirds dry and one-third green, and stood apart. Others returned their rods almost totally green, with a very small portion dry at the tip. There were cracks in them also. Then they stood apart. The rods of others were green only in a very small portion, and the rest were dry. They also stood apart. Others came and brought rods that were green, just as they had received them from the angel. The majority of the crowd returned rods of this kind. The angel was exceedingly pleased with them. They also stood apart. Others returned rods that were green with buds on them. They also stood apart, and the angel was likewise highly pleased with them. 
Others returned rods that were green with buds on them, and the rods even had some fruit. The people whose rods were found to be in this condition were very joyous. The angel was also exultant with them, and the shepherd was very cheerful. The angel of the Lord ordered crowns to be brought. When the crowns, apparently made of palm, had been brought, he bestowed them on those who had returned rods with buds and some fruit, and sent them to the tower. He also sent the rest of them to the tower, those who had returned rods that were green and budding, but without fruit, after giving them a seal. All who went into the tower were clothed in the same way, in garments white as snow. He also sent off those who had returned rods that were green as when they received them, after giving them a white garment and seals. When this was finished, the angel said to the shepherd, I am going away. Send these people off to dwell in their place within the walls, according to the worthiness of each one. Send them off only after having carefully examined their rods. Yes, scrutinize them carefully. Make sure that no one slips by you, he said. But if someone does go by you, I shall put him to the test at the altar. Having said this to the shepherd, he went away. After the departure of the angel, the shepherd said to me, Let us take the rods of all these and plant them. Perhaps some of them may be able to live. I said to him, Sir, how can these dry rods live? He answered and said, This tree is a willow and naturally tenacious of life. So, if they are planted and receive a little moisture, many of the rods will live. Then we shall also try to pour water on them. If any of them can live, I shall rejoice with them. But if none can live, I will not be found neglectful. The shepherd ordered me to call them just as they were stationed. They came up rank by rank and returned their rods to the shepherd. On receiving them, the shepherd planted the rods row by row. After planting them, he poured water on them so copiously that the rods could not be seen above the water. After he had watered the rods, he said to me, Let us go. After a few days we shall return and inspect all the rods. For the one who created this tree wishes all who have taken branches from it to live. I also hope that the majority of these rods, after receiving moisture and having been watered, will live. I said to him, Sir, explain this tree to me. I am perplexed about it. After so many branches have been cut, it is sound and does not look as if anything had been cut from it. This truly perplexes me. I shall tell you, he said. This tree that shades plains and mountains and the whole earth is the law of God given to the whole world. This law is the Son of God proclaimed to the ends of the earth. And the people under its shade are those who have heard the proclamation and believe in him. The great and glorious angel is Michael, who has power over these people and is their captain. For it is Michael who inspires the law in the hearts of the believers. He closely watches the people to whom it is given to see whether they have kept the law. You can see the rods of each individual person, for they are the law. You see that many rods have been rendered useless, so you can know that all these people failed to keep the law. You will also see the dwelling of each. I said to him, Sir, why did he send some to the tower while he left some behind? He has left under my power those who violated the law they received from him to see whether they will repent. 
but those who have already satisfied the law and have kept it, he keeps under his own jurisdiction. I said, Sir, who are those who have received their crowns and have gone into the tower? They are those who have wrestled with the devil and have defeated him. They are crowned. They are the ones who suffered for the law. Also, the others who have returned their rods green with buds, but without fruit, have endured persecution for the law, but have not suffered. However, they did not deny their law. Those who return their rods as green as they received them are holy and righteous and walk in extreme purity of heart, keeping the commandments of the Lord. You will know the rest when I closely inspect the rods that were planted in water. So after a few days, we came to the spot, and the shepherd sat in the place of the angel, while I took a position beside him. He said to me, Tie a towel around you and minister to me. So I tied a clean towel of sackcloth and was ready to minister to him. He said, Call the men whose rods have been planted, according to the rank in which each presented the rods. And I went to the plain and called everyone. And they stood according to their ranks. He said to them, Let each one pull up his rod and bring it to me. The first to return them were those who had had dry and cut rods. And because they were found dry and cut, he commanded them to stand aside. Then those who had dry, but not cut, rods returned them. Some returned the rods green, but some returned them dry and cut, apparently by worms. So he commanded those who had returned them green to stand aside. But those who returned them dried and cut were to stand with the first group. Then those who had half-dried and cracked rods returned them. Many of them gave back green rods without cracks, but some green rods with buds and fruit on the buds, like the people who had been crowned and had entered the tower. However, some returned them dry and worm-eaten, others dried but not worm-eaten, while some were half-dry and had cracks and he commanded each one of them to stand aside, some in their own ranks and others by themselves. Then those who had green rods with cracks returned them. Since these all had green rods, they stood in their own ranks. The shepherd was pleased with them because their rods had all changed and had lost their cracks. Then those who had half green and half dry rods also returned them. The rods of some were found to be completely green, of others half dried, of others still dried and worm eaten, but some were green and had buds. All these were sent away, each to his rank. Then those whose rods were two-thirds green and one-third dry returned them. Many of them returned green rods, many returned half-dried rods, and the rest dried and worm-eaten rods. All these stood in their ranks. Then those who had rods two-thirds dry and one-third green returned them. Many of them returned half-dried rods, but some returned dry and worm-eaten rods, some rods half-dried with cracks, a few returned green ones. All of these people stood in their ranks. Those who had rods with a very small dry portion and cracks returned them. Of this number, some returned them green, and others green with buds. These also went off to their ranks. 
Then those who had rods with a very small portion of green, but otherwise dry, returned them. In this group, the majority were discovered to have rods that were green with buds and fruit on the buds, while the rest of the rods were completely green. The shepherd was exceedingly pleased with those whose rods were found in this condition. They all went off, each to his own rank. After looking closely at all the rods, the shepherd said to me, I told you that this tree is robust. Then he said, Do you see how many repented and were saved? Yes, I do, I said. He said, It is that you may realize how mighty and glorious is the superabundant mercy of the Lord, and that he has granted his spirit to those who are worthy of repentance. Why is it, sir, that all do not repent? I said. He has granted repentance to those whose heart he saw would be made pure and who would serve him with their whole heart. But, lest his name be again defiled, he has not granted repentance to those whose guile and wickedness he saw, for they were making a spurious repentance. I said to him, Now, sir, explain to me what sort of people they are, and where is the dwelling of those who have returned their rods? so that the believers who have received the seal, but have had it broken and failed to keep it whole, might recognize what they have done and repent. And they will receive a seal from you and praise the Lord for having had mercy on them and for sending you to renew their spirits. I shall tell you, he said, the people whose rods were discovered to be dry and worm-eaten are apostates and traitors of the church who blasphemed the Lord in their sins. Furthermore, they were ashamed of the name of the Lord, the name by which they were called. In the end, these people are lost to God. You see that not one of them has repented, though they heard what you told them at my command. Life has departed from people of this kind. And those who return dry rods, not worm-eaten, are similar to them. For they are hypocrites who introduce strange doctrines and pervert the servants of God. In particular, they pervert sinners by not allowing them to repent, but dissuade them by foolish doctrines. However, there is hope of repentance for them. Many of them, as you see, have repented since you spoke my commandments to them. More will repent, but those who will not repent have lost their life. However, those of their number who have repented have become good, and their dwelling is within the first walls. Some even ascended the tower. Then he said, So you see that repentance from sins means life, but failure to repent means death. Now, let me tell you also about those who returned half-dried rods with cracks in them. Those whose rods were half-dry throughout are the double-minded. They are neither dead nor alive. Those who are half-dry and have cracks are the double-minded and slanderers. They are never at peace with one another and are always causing dissensions. But repentance is also possible for them. You see, some from this group have already repented, he said, and there is still hope of repentance for them, he said. All of this group who have repented also have a dwelling in the tower. However, those who were slower in their repentance dwell in the walls, while those who do not repent but persist in their practices die the death. Those who have returned their rods green, though cracked, always were faithful and good. But there was some jealousy among them about first places and points of reputation. Now all of these are foolish to have indulged in rivalry about first places. But these also, after hearing my commandments, were purified and soon repented, since they are good. Therefore their dwelling is in the tower. 
But if any return to dissension, they will be cast out of the tower and will lose their life. Life belongs to all who keep the Lord's commandments. Now, in the commandments there is nothing about first places in any point of honor, but about man's long suffering and humility. Therefore, the life of the Lord is to be found in men of this kind, but death is among promoters of dissension and among transgressors. Those who gave up rods half dry and half green are the persons engrossed in their business who fail to adhere to the holy ones. For this reason one half is living and the other half is dead. So many who have heard my commandments have repented. For those who repented have a dwelling in the tower. But some of them were apostates to the end. Therefore they have no repentance for they blasphemed the Lord and denied Him on account of their business affairs. Consequently, they lost their life because of their wicked practices. Many of this group were double-minded. These still have repentance in their power, provided they repent swiftly. Then they will have a dwelling in the tower. Even if they repent rather slowly, they will dwell within the tower. But. If they fail to repent, they also have lost their life. Those who returned rods two-thirds green and one-third dry are the persons who denied the Lord on various occasions. Many of this group have repented and returned to the tower to dwell. However, many fell away from God completely. These finally lost life in the end and some of this group were double-minded and caused dissensions. So they have repentance if they repent swiftly and if they do not persist in their self-indulgence. But if they do persist in their ways, they also work death for themselves. Those who return their rods two-thirds dry and one-third green are the persons who had been faithful but became rich and made a name among the heathen. They put on a supercilious demeanor, became haughty, and so abandoned the truth and did not adhere to the righteous. Instead, they lived in the manner of the heathen, and among them a manner of life more agreeable to them. However, they did not fall away from God, but clung to the faith without doing its works. Many of them repented and their dwelling was in the tower, but others, who lived and associated constantly with the heathen, were corrupted by their vain opinions to fall away from God and act in the manner of the heathen. Such persons are considered heathen. But others in this group were double-minded and had no hope of being saved on account of their deeds. Others, again, were double-minded but caused divisions among their associates. There is still repentance for those who are double-minded because of their doings. However, if they would have a dwelling within the tower, their repentance must be swift. But death is at hand to those who do not repent and persist in their pleasures. Those who returned their rods green, but dry-tipped and cracked, were always good, faithful, and glorious in the sight of God but they committed sin in a small degree out of trifling desires or because they had petty quarrels with one another. But upon hearing my words, the majority quickly repented and their dwelling was set in the tower. But some were double-minded, and in their double-mindedness they created a greater dissension. Still, there is some hope of repentance for them because at all times they were good. Only with difficulty will any of them die. Those who return their rods dry, with only the slightest touch of green, are believers, but their actions were those of iniquity. However, they never fell away from God and gladly bore the name. In their houses they also received God's servants graciously. Therefore, when they heard of this repentance, 
They repented without hesitation, and now they are accomplishing all virtue and righteousness. Some of them, too, are willing to suffer and endure affliction because they realize the malice of their former actions. Therefore, the dwelling of all these people is the tower. After finishing the explanation of all the rods, he said to me, Go and tell everyone to repent and live to God. The Lord in His mercy has sent me to grant repentance to all, although some are unworthy because of their works. But in His long suffering, the Lord wishes for those who were called through His Son to be saved. I said to him, Sir, I hope that those who have heard this will repent. I am quite sure that each one who realizes his personal acts will repent out of fear of the Lord. He answered and said, Those who repent with their whole heart and purify themselves of all the wickedness as previously described, without adding more to their former sins, will receive a remedy for their former sins from the Lord, provided they are not beset by double-mindedness in fulfilling my commandments. They will live to God. But those who add to their sins and revert to the lusts of this world will bring the condemnation of death on themselves. As for you, walk in my commandments and live to God. They too who walk in these commandments and act uprightly will live to God. After showing and telling me all this, he said, I shall show you the rest in a few days. Chapter 27 The Ninth Parable, Part 1 When I had written the mandates and the parables of the shepherd, the angel of repentance came and said, I want to point out to you what the Holy Spirit showed you while speaking to you in the form of the church. For that Spirit is the Son of God. Since you were rather weak in the flesh, it was not explained to you by an angel. However, when you were empowered by the Spirit and you grew in strength sufficient to see an angel, then the building of the tower was revealed to you by the church. You have looked at everything in a good and reverent manner as befits what comes from a virgin. Now instruction is being given you by the same Spirit through an angel. You must learn everything from me in greater detail. It was for this purpose that I was assigned by the glorious angel to dwell in your house, that you might have powerful insight into everything, without any fear as it was before. Then he led me off to Arcadia, to a certain breast-shaped mountain, and set me down on top of the mountain. From here, he showed me a huge plain, surrounded by twelve mountains, each different in appearance. The first was black as pitch. The second was bare, without any vegetation. The third was full of thorns and thistles. The fourth had half-dried herbage. The top of the grass was green, but the parts about the roots were dry, while some of the vegetation became scorched by the sun. The fifth mountain had green vegetation, in spite of the fact that it was rough. The sixth mountain was full of crevices, some of them small and large. However, the crevices contained plants, but these were barely flourishing and apparently withered. The seventh mountain contained cheerful vegetation, and it was flourishing everywhere, with all kinds of cattle and birds feeding on it. And the more the cattle and birds fed, all the more did the vegetation on that mountain blossom. In the eighth, was full of springs, and every kind of the Lord's creatures was provided with water from the springs on that mountain. But the ninth mountain was completely devoid of water, and was utterly deserted. However, 
There were wild beasts and deadly serpents that destroy men. The tenth mountain had huge trees, affording complete shade. And under their shade, sheep were resting and ruminating. The eleventh mountain was covered with trees, fruit-bearing trees, each adorned with various sorts of fruits. A person seeing this fruit would be moved with desire to eat of it. The twelfth mountain was completely white, and its sight was attractive. It was most beautiful in itself. And in the middle of the plain, he pointed out to me a huge white rock rising out of it. Now the rock was higher than the mountains, four square, of a size to contain the whole world. It was old, and a door had been cut out of it, but this door seemed to me to have been hewn recently. The gate shimmered so much more than that of the sun that I marveled at its brilliance. Twelve virgins stood in a circle around the gate. Now, the four that stood at the corners seemed to me to be more noble than the others, though the others also seemed noble. They stood at the four parts of the gate, each with two virgins between them. They were dressed in linen mantles and had beautiful girdles. Their right shoulders were exposed, as if they were about to carry a load. They were ready, cheerful, and eager. On seeing this, I said to myself, You are looking at something great and glorious. But once again I was at a loss to explain these virgins, because, though they were so delicate, they stood courageously, as if ready to hold up the whole heavens. And the shepherd said to me, Why are you reasoning to yourself? And why are you so perplexed in making yourself sad? What you cannot understand, do not try to understand if you have sense. But ask the Lord and you will receive intelligence and understanding. You cannot see what is behind you, but you are seeing what lies ahead. So, pass over what you cannot see and do not torture yourself. Master what you see and do not waste your labor about the rest. Everything I point out to you, I shall explain to you. Therefore, look upon the things that remain. I saw six men coming, tall, noble, and similar in appearance, and they called a multitude of men. The others who were advancing were also tall, handsome, and strong. The latter were commanded by the six to build a tower on top of the rock. The noise of the men who were coming to build the tower was extraordinary, for they were running here and there about the gate. Now, the virgins who were standing around the gate told the men to hurry and build the tower. The virgins stretched out their hands, as though they were about to receive something from the men. The six men gave orders for stones to come up from some abyss and to go into the building of the tower. Then ten glistening, unhewn, square stones came up. Then the six men called to the virgins and directed them to carry all the stones that were coming for building the tower walk through the gate and pass them on to the men supposed to build the tower. Then the virgins heaped up the first ten stones that came out of the abyss on one another, and carried them in one load by their united effort. In the same position in which they stood around the gate, those who seemed strong enough stooped down under the corners of the stone and carried it, while the others got under the sides. This is the way they carried all the stones. They carried them through the gate as they had been directed, and passed them on to the men on the tower. Once the latter had the stones, they built. 
The tower was built on top of the huge stone above the gate. Then those ten stones were joined together and covered the whole rock and became the foundation of the building of the tower. The rock and gate were the support of the whole tower. After the ten stones, twenty-five others came out of the abyss. These were also carried by the virgins like the first, and were joined together in the building of the tower. After these stones, there came up thirty-five more, and they were joined together like the rest in the building of the tower. Next, forty more came up, and all these also were put into the building of the tower. So there were four stories in the foundations of the tower. Then there was a pause in the ascent of stones from the abyss, and the workers also held up for a short while. Then once more, the six men gave orders to the masses to bring along stones from the mountains for the building of the tower. Then stones of various colors were brought along from all the mountains. They had been hewn by the men and handed to the virgins, who carried them through the gate and passed them on for the building of the tower. Now when the varicolored stones were placed into the building, all of them changed their color and became white. However, some stones handed in by the men for the building did not become shiny, but were found to be of the same color as when they were being put into the building. For they had not been handed over by the virgins, nor had they been carried through the gate. These stones were unsightly in the building of the tower. When the six men saw that the stones were unsightly, they gave orders that they be taken out and carried down to the particular place from where they had come. And they said to the men who were bringing the stones in, You must not bring any stones at all into the building, but set them beside the tower for the virgins to carry them through the gate and hand them into the building. For if these stones have not been carried by the hands of the virgins, they cannot change their colors. Therefore, do not labor in vain, they said. Now, on that day, the building operations were finished, but the tower was not completed, for additions still had to be made. There was a cessation in the building, and the six men ordered all of the builders to withdraw for a short while and rest, but ordered the virgins not to withdraw from the tower. It seemed to me that they had been left there to guard it. After everyone had departed to rest, I said to the shepherd, Why is it, sir, that the building of the tower is not finished? And he said, It cannot yet be finished, unless the lord of the tower comes and expects the building to find out whether some stones are unsound. Then he can change them, for the tower is being built according to his wishes. Sir, I said, I would like to know what is the meaning of the building of this tower. I would like to know about the rock, the gate, the mountains, the virgins, and the stones that have come out of the abyss unhewn and yet have gone into the building. Furthermore, why are ten stones first put into the foundations, then twenty-five, then thirty-five, and then forty? I would also like to know about the stones that went into the building and were taken out again and placed back in their original place. Quiet my soul on all these points, sir, and let me know." He said, If it turns out that you are not idly curious, you will know all. For after a few days we shall come, and you will see the rest of the materials coming to this tower. Then you will understand the parables accurately. Chapter 28, The Ninth Parable, Part 2 So after a few days, we came to the place where we had sat, and he said to me, Let us go to the tower, for the owner is coming to inspect it. 
So we went to the tower, but absolutely no one was around it, except only the virgins. And the shepherd asked the virgins whether the master of the tower had come there. And they answered that he intended to come and inspect the building. And behold, after a short while, I saw an array of many people advancing, and in their midst was a man whose height exceeded that of the tower. Now the six men in charge of the building were walking with him on his right and left. All those engaged in the building were with him, and many other distinguished people were about him. The virgins who kept watch on the tower ran forward and kissed him and began to walk beside him around the tower. The very tall man examined the building carefully, even handling every stone individually. Taking a staff in his hand, he struck each individual stone that had been placed in the building. After his blow, some stones became black as soot, some mildewed, some showed cracks, some were chipped, some were neither white nor black, some rough and did not fit with the other stones, and some had many stains. Such were the various appearances of the unsound stones found in the building. Therefore, he gave orders that all these stones be removed from the building and placed beside the tower, and other stones be carried in and used as replacements. And the builders asked him from what mountain he wished stones to be carried and used in their place. But he did not command stones to be carried from the mountains. Instead, he commanded them from a nearby plain. When the plain was broken, brilliant square stones were found, as well as some spherical ones. And all of the stones that were in the plain were carried and borne through the gate by the virgins. The square stones were trimmed and put into the place of those that had been removed. The round stones were not fitted into the building, because they were too hard to trim, and appeared to yield slowly to the chisel, but they were placed beside the tower, as if they would soon be trimmed and placed into the building, for they were extraordinarily brilliant. When he had finished, the distinguished man, the lord of the whole tower, called the shepherd and put him in charge of all the stones lying next to the tower, which had been cast out of the structure. He said to him, Clean these stones carefully and use them for the building of the tower. Those that can fit with the others, those that do not fit, throw them far away from the tower. After giving these orders to the shepherd, he left the tower accompanied by those with whom he had come. But the virgins remained standing around the tower and kept watch over it. I said to the shepherd, how can these stones be used once more in the building, after having been rejected? He answered and said, Do you see these stones? I do, sir, I said. I shall trim the majority of them, he said, and place them into the building where they will fit in with the rest. But, sir, how can they fill the same space after having been trimmed? I asked. He answered and said, Those found to be too small will find place in the center of the building, but those that are larger will be put on the outside and will afford support to the former. After these remarks he said to me, Come along. After two days we shall return and clean these stones and throw them into the building. For everything around the building must be cleaned in case the master should suddenly come for he will be angry if he finds that the approaches to the tower are dirty, and that these stones have not gone into the tower. It would make it appear to the master that I am inattentive. 
Chapter 29, The Ninth Parable, Part 3 So, after two days, when we returned to the tower, he said to me, Let us examine all the stones, and determine those that can go into the building. Yes, sir, I said. At first, we examined the black stones, and we found that they were the same as when they had been removed from the building. The shepherd gave orders that they be moved away from the tower and put at a distance. Then he examined those that were mildewed. Many of these he took and trimmed and commanded the virgins to take and put them into the building. So they took them and put them into the building, into the center of the tower, but the rest he ordered to be placed with the black stones since they also turned out to be black. Next, he examined the stones with cracks. Many of these he trimmed and gave orders that they be carried into the building by the virgins. But they were placed on the outside of the walls because they turned out to be more sound than the others. But the rest, because of their excessive number of cracks, could not be trimmed. For this reason, they were cast away from the building of the tower. Next, he examined the stones that were chipped. Among them, many turned out to be black and had developed large cracks. Therefore, he also had these put aside with the rejected stones. With those left over, he cleaned and trimmed and commanded to be put into the building. And the virgins took up these stones and fitted them into the center of the tower, for they were rather weak. His inspection next turned to the half-white, half-black stones, many of which were found to be black. And he gave orders that these also be taken out with the rejected stones. All the rest proved to be white and were taken up by the virgins, for, since they were white, they could be fitted into the building by the virgins themselves. Moreover, they were placed on the outside because they turned out to be sound and able to support those which were placed in the center, for none of them were completely chipped. Then he examined those that were hard and rough, a few of these were rejected because they could not be trimmed and turned out to be very hard. However, the rest were trimmed and taken up by the virgins to be put into the middle of the building of the tower since they were rather weak. Then he examined the stones that had stains. Very few of them had been blackened and had to be rejected with the rest. The greater part were glistening and sound and were fitted into the building by the virgins. Because of their strength, they were placed on the outside. Then he went to look at the white spherical stones and said to me, What are we to do with these stones? How am I to know, sir? I said. He said, Do you not notice anything about them? Sir? I am not familiar with this handicraft, I said. I am not a stone cutter and cannot know. Do you not see that they are very round? He said. And if I should wish to square them, I shall have to lop off a great deal? However, some of them have to be put into the building. I said, well, sir, if it must be, why do you torture yourself? instead of choosing those you want for the building and fitting them into it. Then he chose the larger, brilliant ones from among these stones and trimmed them, and the virgins took them up and fitted them into the outside portions of the building, and the rest were taken up and put back upon the plain from where they had been carried. However, they were not rejected. Because, he said, there still remains yet a small part of the tower to be built. And the master of the tower is exceedingly anxious to have these stones fitted because they are very brilliant. 
twelve women of most beautiful appearance were then called. They were dressed in black and wore girdles. Their shoulders were exposed and their hair was hanging loose. These women seemed to me to be savage. The shepherd gave orders to them to take up the stones rejected from the building and to carry them back to the mountains from where they had been taken. They picked up and cheerfully carried away all the stones and put them in the place from where they had been taken. After all the stones had been picked up and there was not a single one lying around the tower, the shepherd said to me, Let us walk around the tower to see whether there is any defect in it. So I walked around with him. At the sight of the tower's beautiful structure, he was exceedingly cheerful. In fact, it was so beautifully constructed that I yearned for it when I saw it. It was built as if it were a single stone without any joint in it. The stone looked as if it had been hewn out of the rock, for it seemed to be of one piece. As I was walking with him, I was full of joy at this beautiful sight. The shepherd said to me, Go and bring unslaked lime and fine clay to fill up the marks left by the stones that were taken up and put into the building. Everything around the tower must be smooth. I did as he told me and brought these to him. He said, Help me and the work will soon be finished. Then he removed the traces of the stones that had gone into the building and gave orders to sweep around the tower and to make it clean. And the virgins took brooms and swept all the rubbish taken out of the tower, washed the site with water, and made it pleasant and most attractive. Then the shepherd said to me, Everything has been cleaned, he said. Whenever the Lord comes to inspect his tower, he will be unable to blame us in anything. With these words he wished to depart, but I took hold of him by his sack and began entreating him by the Lord to explain what he had shown me. He said to me, I am busy for a little while, then I shall explain everything. Wait here until I return. I said to him, What shall I do here all by myself? You will not be alone, he said, for these virgins will be with you. Put me in their care, I said. So the shepherd called them and said to them, I am entrusting this person to you until I return. Then he left. So I stayed alone with the virgins, who were quite cheerful and well disposed to me, especially the four of superior dignity. The virgin said to me, The shepherd will not return today. Then what shall I do? I said. Wait for him until tomorrow. If he comes, he will speak with you. If he does not, stay with us here until he comes. I said to them, I shall wait for him until evening. But if he does not come, I shall go home and return early in the morning. They answered and said, you have been entrusted to us. You cannot leave us. Where shall I stay then? I said. You will pass the night with us as a brother, not as a husband, they said. For you are our brother. And in the time to come, we intend to stay with you because we love you dearly. However, I was ashamed to stay with them. Then the one who seemed to be the leader began to kiss and embrace me. And when the others saw her kiss and embrace me, they also began to kiss me and to chase me around the tower and play. At this, I also became like a young man and played with them. Some danced, some gavotted, others sang. I kept silent as I moved in their company around the tower thrilled to be with them. When evening came, I wished to go home. However, 
They held on to me and did not let me go. So I stayed with them for the night and slept near the tower. The virgins spread their linen tunics on the ground and made me lie down in the midst of them. Yet, they did absolutely nothing else except pray. And without ceasing, I also prayed no less than they did. The virgins were glad to see me praying in this way. I remained there with them until the second hour of the following day. Then the shepherd came back and said to the virgins, Have you done him any wrong? Ask him, they said. Sir, I was delighted to stay with them, I said. What have you had for supper? Sir, our supper all night was the words of the Lord, I said. Did they treat you well? He asked. Yes, sir, I said. Chapter 30, The Ninth Parable, Part 4 What do you wish to hear before anything else? He asked. I said, Sir, I would like to ask you questions in the order in which you pointed things out to me and to have you give explanations in the order of my questions. Just as you please, he said. I shall give you explanations, then I shall conceal absolutely nothing from you. Sir, first of all, tell me this, I said. What is the rock and the gate? He said, This rock and this gate is the Son of God. But sir, I said, why is it that the rock is ancient, whereas the gate is new? Listen to me, and you will know why, ignorant man, he said. The Son of God is born before all his creation, and so is counselor to his Father in his creation. For this reason, the rock is ancient. But sir, why is the gate new, I said, and he said, Because. He has manifested himself in the last days of the consummation of things, and for this reason the gate is new. In this way, those who are destined to be saved enter the kingdom of God through the gate. Then he said, Do you not see that the stones that have entered through the gate go into the building of the tower, whereas those that have not so entered are cast off and sent back to their original place? Yes, sir, I said. For that reason also, no one enters the kingdom of God without receiving the name of his Son. For if you desire to enter some city that has a wall all around it and only one gate, you cannot possibly enter without going through the available gate. Sir, how else could one enter? I said. In the same way that you cannot enter a city except through this gate, so no man can enter the kingdom of God except through the name of his beloved Son. He said, Do you see the crowd of tower builders? Yes, sir, I said. These are all glorious angels, he said. The Lord is walled about by them. But the gate is the Son of God, the only entrance to the Lord. Therefore, no one can enter him except through his son. He said, Do you see the six men and the noble, tall man in their midst, the one who walked around the tower and rejected the stones from the building? Yes, sir, I said. The noble man is the son of God, he said. And the six are the glorious angels who support him on the right and on the left. None of these angels can go before God except in his company. He said, Anyone who fails to receive his name will not enter into the kingdom of God. Now about the tower, what is it? I said. This tower is the church. He said. And the virgins, who are they? I said.
They are holy spirits, he said. No man will be found in the kingdom of God unless they clothe him with their raiment. For if you only receive the name without receiving the raiment from them, it is of no avail. The virgins are the powers of the Son of God. If you bear the name without his power, you are bearing the name in vain. Then he said, Now the rejected stones that you see are those who bore the name but did not put on the raiment of the virgins. What kind of garment is this raiment of theirs? I said. Their own names are the garment, he said. Anyone who bears the name of the Son of God is also bound to bear their names. Even the Son of God himself bears the names of these virgins. All the stones that you saw going into the building of the tower and distributed by the hands of the virgins to remain in the building are clothed with the power of the virgins, he said. For this reason, you see the tower of rock as having become one single stone. And so, those who believe in the Lord through his Son and have clothed themselves with these spirits will be one spirit, one body with a single color to their raiment. And the dwelling of those who bear the names of the virgins are in the tower. Now, sir, these rejected stones, why are they rejected? I said. They have come through the gate and have been set in the building by the hands of the virgins. Since you show interest and inquire accurately, I shall tell you about the rejected stones. He said. They all received the name of the Son of God, as well as the power of the virgins. So, on receiving these spirits, they obtained power and were associated with the servants of God. They had one spirit, one body, and one raiment, for they had the same mind and practiced righteousness. However, after some time they were led astray by the beautiful women you saw dressed in black garments, with bare shoulders and hair hanging down loosely, and beautiful in appearance. At their sight they were filled with desire for them, clothed themselves with their power, and shed the power of the virgins. Therefore they were ejected from the house of God and handed over to the women. But those who were not led astray by the beauty of these women remained in the house of God. There you have the interpretation of the rejected stones. Now, sir, suppose that these men, in spite of their condition, should repent and cast off their desire for these women and return to the virgins, I said. And also, suppose that they walk in their power and in their deeds, Will they not enter the kingdom of God? He said, They will enter if they cast off the works of these women and assume the power of the virgins, so as to walk in their deeds. That is the reason there was a pause in the building of the tower, so they could repent and return to the building of the tower. However, if they do not repent, then others will enter, and they themselves will be finally rejected. At all this, I gave thanks to the Lord that he had had mercy upon all who call upon his name, and that he had sent the angel of repentance to us who have sinned against him. I gave thanks that he had renewed our spirit, and that now, when we were lost without hope of life, he had renewed our life. Now, sir, I said, Explain, why is it that the tower is not erected on the ground, but on the rock in the gate? Are you still ignorant and without understanding? He said. I have to ask all these questions, sir, because I am unable to understand anything, I said. All these matters are awesome, glorious, and difficult for men to understand. I shall tell you, he said. The name of the Son of God is great and incomprehensible and sustains the whole world. Now, 
If all of creation is sustained by the Son of God, what do you think about those called by Him who bear His name and walk in His commandments? Do you see what kind of people He sustains? Those who bear His name with their whole heart. Therefore, He has been made their foundation and gladly sustains them because they are not ashamed to bear His name. I said, Sir, let me know the names of the virgins and of the women dressed in black raiment. I shall tell you the names of the stronger virgins, those standing at the corners. He said, The first one is faith, the second is continence, the third is fortitude, and the fourth is long-suffering. The other standing between them in the middle are called simplicity, innocence, purity, cheerfulness, truth, understanding, concord, and love. The one who bears these names and that of the Son of God can enter into the kingdom of God. Let me also tell you the names of the women with the dark raiment. He said, Four of these are also more powerful. The first is unbelief. The second is incontinence. The third, disobedience. And the fourth, deceit. Their companions are called grief, wickedness, licentiousness, irascibility, lying, foolishness, slander and hatred. The servant of God who bears these names can indeed see the kingdom of God, but cannot enter it. Now, sir, these stones that were taken out of the abyss and fitted into the building, what are they? I said. The first ten put into the foundations are the first generation. He said, The twenty-five are the second generation of righteous men. The thirty-five are the prophets and ministers of God. While the forty are the apostles and the teachers who proclaim the Son of God. Then why, sir, did the virgins also carry the stones through the gate and pass them on for the building of the tower? I said. These first stones bore these spirits. He said, They were never at all separated from one another, neither the spirits from men, nor the men from the spirits. No, their spirits remained with them until they fell asleep. Unless these spirits had persisted with them, they would not have been useful for the building of this tower. Sir, tell me another thing, I said. What is it? He said. I said. Sir, why did the stones that had borne these spirits go up from the abyss, and why were they put into the building of the tower? They had to ascend through water in order to be made alive. He said. They could not enter the kingdom of God in any other way unless they shed the death of their former life. So also, those who fell asleep received the seal of the Son of God and entered the kingdom of God. For before receiving the name of the Son of God, a man is dead. But when he receives the seal, he puts off death and receives life. Therefore the seal is water. The dead go down into the water and come up alive. Therefore this seal was proclaimed to them, and they put it to use to enter the kingdom of God. Then why, sir, did the forty stones come out of the abyss with them, if they already had the seal? I said. And he said, Because these apostles and teachers, who proclaimed the name of the Son of God, after having fallen asleep in power and faith of the Son of God, also proclaimed to those who had fallen asleep before them, and passed on the seal of the proclamation. So they went down with them into the water and came up again. But the apostles and teachers, 
though they were alive, went down and came up alive. But those who had fallen asleep before them went down dead and came up alive. With the help of the apostles and teachers, they were made to live and came to the knowledge of the name of the Son of God. This is why these others also arose with them, and together were fitted into the building of the tower, and were made to dwell along with them without needing to have been trimmed. They fell asleep in righteousness and great purity. They merely did not have the seal. Now you have the solution of this matter also. Yes, sir, I said. Chapter 31 The Ninth Parable, Part 5 Now, sir, I said, tell me about the mountains. Why are some of one shape and color, and others of other shapes and colors? I shall tell you, he said. These twelve mountains are the twelve tribes that inhabit the whole earth. The Son of God was proclaimed to them by the apostles. But why are they varicolored? I said. Explain to me, sir, why some of the mountains are one shape and others of another. I shall tell you, he said. These twelve tribes that inhabit the earth are twelve nations. They are varied in understanding and in mind. The varieties of mind and understanding among the nations correspond to the varicolored mountains. I shall explain the conduct of each. I said, First of all, sir, show why, though the mountains are of such different colors, when their stones are fitted into the building, that they all become of one color, brilliant, like those that come up out of the abyss. He said, The reason is, that all the nations that dwell under the heavens, after hearing and believing, are called by one name, that of the Son of God. So, when they receive the seal, they have one understanding and one mind, one faith and one love, and they bear the spirits of the virgins along with the name. Consequently, the building of the tower becomes bright as the sun and of one color. But after they had entered one place and had become one body, some of them sullied themselves and were banished from the society of the righteous to become what they formerly were, only worse. I said, Sir, how did they become worse after having known God? He said, The person who has not known God and commits wickedness receives some punishment for his wickedness. But the person who has known God is required to do no wicked actions and must do good. The person who ought to do good having known God, and still acts wickedly, certainly seems to commit a greater wickedness than the person who does not know God. For this reason, then, those who have not known God and act wickedly are sentenced to death, whereas those who have known God and have seen His mighty works and yet act wickedly for the second time will be punished and will die forever. In this manner the Church of God will be purified. For as you have seen the stones removed from the tower and handed to the wicked spirits to be cast out along with them, there shall be one body of the purified. Just as the tower also became as one stone after its purification, in the same way it will be with the Church of God after the purification and the purging of evildoers, the hypocrites, blasphemers, the double-minded, and perpetrators of various crimes. After these have been banished, the Church of God will become one body, one understanding, one mind, one faith, and one love. Then, too, the Son of God will be glad and rejoice in their midst because He has received His people pure. All this, sir, is awesome and glorious, I said. But one more thing, sir, I said. Explain to me the power and conduct of each of the mountains, so that every soul that trusts in the Lord may hear 
and praise his mighty, marvelous, and glorious name. I shall explain the variety of the mountains and of the twelve nations, he said. Out of the first mountain, the black one, come believers of this kind, apostates and blasphemers against the Lord, betrayers of the servants of God. Repentance is impossible for them. Death is their destiny, and for that reason also, they are black because their race is lawless. From the second mountain, the bare one, come believers of this kind, hypocrites and teachers of wickedness. These also are like the first without fruits of righteousness. Just as their mountain is without fruit, so men of this kind have the name but are devoid of faith. There is no fruit of truth in them. Therefore, repentance is offered to these if they repent promptly, but if they dally, their portion will be death along with the former. Sir, why is repentance possible for these, but not for the former? Their actions are practically the same. The reason why repentance is possible for the second class is because they have not blasphemed their Lord, nor have they betrayed God's servants. He said, But from a desire of gain, they acted like hypocrites, and each one taught in accordance with the lusts of sinful men. But they must pay the penalty. However, repentance is offered to them because they have not blasphemed, nor have they betrayed. From the third mountain, with the thorns and thistles, come believers of this kind, the rich and those involved in many business affairs. The thorns are the rich, and the thistles are those involved in varied business affairs. Those who are involved in many varied business affairs do not adhere to the servants of God, but wander in error and are choked by their business preoccupations. The rich have difficulty adhering to the servants of God because they fear that they may ask them for something. Therefore, such people will enter the kingdom of God only with difficulty. So, for these people, it is just as hard to enter into the kingdom of God as it is to walk among thorns without shoes. However, repentance is possible for all these people, but it has to be swift. Since they were formerly idle, they must now hasten back to former days and do something worthwhile. After they repent and do good, they will live to God. But if they persist in their conduct, they will be handed over to those women who will put them to death. From the fourth mountain, with the many weeds, some green at the top but dried at the roots, and some scorched by the sun, come believers of this kind, the double-minded who have the Lord on their lips but not in their hearts. For this reason their foundations are dry without strength. Only their words are living, but their works are dead. People like this are neither alive nor dead. The double-minded are also like this. They are neither green nor dry. They are neither alive nor dead. Just as their weeds wither at the sight of the sun, so also do the double-minded worship idols in their cowardice and are ashamed of the name of their Lord when they hear of persecution. Thus, people like this are neither alive nor dead. But if they repent swiftly, they will be able to live. But if they do not repent, they are already in the hands of the women who take away their life from them. From the fifth mountain, that is rough with green plants, come believers of this kind, believers who are faithful but hard learners, opinionated and self-satisfied. Though they wish to know everything, yet they know absolutely nothing. Because of their presumption, understanding is far from them, 
and foolishness and stupidity has entered into them. They praise themselves as though they had wisdom, and they wish to become self-authenticating teachers, although they are destitute of sense. Therefore, on account of this pride, many who exalt themselves have been made empty by their haughtiness. For stubbornness and vain self-confidence is a mighty demon. Many of this group have been rejected, although some repented and believed and subjected themselves to those who had understanding once they realized their own senselessness. For the rest, repentance is possible. For they are not wicked, rather they have become senseless and foolish. Provided they repent, these persons will live to God. But if they do not repent, they will dwell with the women who devise evil against them. The believers that come out of the sixth mountain, with the great and small clefts and withering plants in the clefts, are of this kind. Those with small clefts are persons who hold things against one another and have withered in the faith because of their backbiting. However, many of this group have repented, and the rest will repent when they hear my commandments, for their backbitings are small and they will repent quickly. But those with large cracks persist in their backbitings and hold grudges in their rage against one another. These have been thrown out of the tower and have been pronounced unworthy of the building. This kind of person will live with difficulty. Now if our God and Lord, who is ruler of all things and has power over all his creation, does not remember evil against those who have confessed their sins but is merciful, how is it then that a corruptible man full of sins holds a grudge as if he were able to destroy and to save. I, the angel of repentance, declare to all of you who live in such disunion, put this away, repent, and the Lord will heal your former sins, provided you are purified of this demon. If you are not, you will be handed over to him for death. From the seventh mountain, in which there are green and pleasant plants, and which is flourishing in all its extent, where every kind of cattle and the birds of the heavens feed on the plants, and where the plants on which they feed become ever more flourishing from this mountain, come believers of this kind. Persons at all times simple, innocent and blessed, without a grudge against one another, who, on the contrary, always rejoice in God's servants and have clothed themselves with the Holy Spirit of these virgins, who, merciful to every man, lend assistance to them without reproach and without hesitation. Therefore, the Lord, upon seeing their simplicity and childlike guilelessness, has made the labor of their hands flourish and bestowed favor on them in their whole conduct. I, the angel of repentance, declare to you who belong to this group, remain as you are, and your seed will never be wiped out until the end of the age. For the Lord has tested you and has inscribed you in our number. All your descendants will dwell with the Son of God, for you have received from His Spirit. From the eighth mountain, where the fountains are, that watered all the Lord's creation, come believers of this kind, apostles and teachers who proclaim to the whole world and those who taught the word of the Lord with reverence and purity, persons who do not turn one whit aside for evil desire, but walk at all times in righteousness and in truth in accordance with the Holy Spirit that they received. Therefore, those of this kind will enter in with the angels. From the ninth mountain, which is deserted and has serpents and wild beasts that destroy men, come believers of this kind. The stones with spots are the ministers who administered their office wickedly 
and plundered widows and orphans of livelihood, who make profit for themselves out of the ministry which they receive to administer. If they persist in the same desire, they are dead and there is no hope of life for them. But if they turn from their ways and fulfill their ministry with integrity, they can live. The stones that are mildewed are those who denied their Lord and did not turn back to Him. Shriveled and wasted, they did not adhere to the servants of God, but live in solitude and are destroying their own souls. These men are like a vine. Left by itself behind a fence, it gets no care and is wasted by weeds. In time, it goes wild and is no longer of any use to the master. In the same way, these men have given themselves up in despair and, in their savage habits, have become useless to their Lord. Therefore, repentance is possible for these men, provided they are not found to have denied from the heart. But if it is found that one of these men has denied from the heart, I do not know whether he can live. This I say not with regard to the present, namely, that one who denies now might obtain repentance. For it is now impossible for a man to be saved who intends to deny his Lord. But there does seem to be a possibility for those who denied him in the past to obtain repentance. So, if one intends to repent, let him hurry before the tower is completed. Otherwise, he will be devastated to death by the women. Now, the chip stones are deceitful persons and backbiters. They are the wild beasts you saw on the mountain. The words of these men hurt and slay a man, just as the serpents hurt and kill with their venom. These persons are chipped in their faith because of their conduct toward one another. However, some of them have repented and have been saved. And the others of the same kind can be saved if they will undergo repentance. If they do not repent, they will be slain by those women whose power they enjoy. From the tenth mountain, where there were trees affording shelter to some sheep, come believers of this kind, overseers friendly to strangers and who gladly receive the servants of God into their homes without dissimulation. They have given shelter unceasingly by their own service to those who were in want and to the widows, and their conduct has always been pure. Therefore, they will be given shelter by the Lord forever. Those who act in this way are glorious in God's sight and their place is already with the angels, provided they persist to the end in their service to the Lord. From the eleventh mountain, where the trees are laden with the weight of various kinds of fruit, come believers of this kind. Those who have suffered for the sake of the name of the Son of God, who bore sufferings cheerfully with their whole heart, and who have laid down their lives. But sir, I said, why do all the trees bear fruit, but some of them more beautiful fruit than others? I shall tell you, he said, all those who have ever suffered for the name are glorious in God's sight, and all their sins are remitted because they suffered for the name of the Son of God. Now I shall tell you why their fruits are different and why some of them surpass others. All who were tortured and did not deny when called before the magistrates, but suffered with alacrity, are decidedly more glorious in the Lord's sight and their fruit is superior. But those who were cowardly and lost in uncertainty, who debated in their hearts whether to deny or confess, yet finally suffered, the fruit of these people is inferior because this deliberation entered their heart. It is an evil deliberation that a servant should deny his own Lord. If any of you have such deliberation, take care, lest it will remain in your hearts and you perish unto God. 
And you who have suffered for the sake of the name ought to praise God, because He has deemed you worthy of bearing the name and that all your sins might be healed. Therefore, count yourselves blessed. Consider that you have performed a mighty deed if one of you suffers for God. The Lord is bestowing life upon you, and you are not aware of it. For your sins have weighed you down, and, if you have not suffered for the name of the Lord, you would have died to God on account of these sins. This I declare to those who have hesitated between denial and confession. Confess that you hold fast to the Lord, lest you be handed over and put in prison for your denial. If he then punish their slaves when one of them denies his master, what do you think your Lord will do, who has power over all things? Remove such deliberation from your hearts, that you may live forever to God. From the twelfth mountain, which was white, come believers of this kind. They are innocent as infants, into whose hearts no guile enters, and they do not know what wickedness is, constant in their innocence. These believers, then, undoubtedly live in the kingdom of God because they have not defiled the commandments of God in any regard. All the days of their lives they have innocently persisted in the same resolution. Those who will remain constant and will be like infants without evil guile will be more glorious than all who have been previously mentioned. He said, Every child is glorious in God's sight and comes to Him before all others. Therefore, blessed are you who have removed wickedness and clothed yourselves with innocence. You will live to God before all the rest. Chapter 32, The Ninth Parable, Part 6 After he had finished the parables of the mountains, I said to him, Now, sir, Give me an explanation of the stones that were removed from the plain and were put in the building in place of the stones taken out of the tower. Explain also the spherical stones put in the building and those that still remain spherical. I shall tell you about all these, he answered. The stones removed from the plain and placed into the building of the tower, instead of those that were rejected, are the base of this white mountain. Since it was found that the believers from this mountain were all innocent, the Lord gave orders that the believers from the base of this mountain be used for the building of the tower, for He knew that these stones will remain brilliant and not one of them will become black when they go into the building of the tower. Whereas, if He had taken and put in those from some other mountains, it would have been necessary for Him to come back to the tower to cleanse it. However, it was found that all these people who believe and who will believe are white, for they are of the same kind. They are blessed and innocent. Now I shall tell you about those brilliant spherical stones, all taken from this white mountain. First, I must tell you why they were found spherical. Their riches clouded their minds to the truth and obscured it. However, they never fell away from the true God, and no evil word proceeded from their lips, but all was justice and the virtue of truth. So when the Lord saw their frame of mind, and that they were able to lean towards the truth and remain virtuous, He had their riches cut off from them. But He did not remove their riches altogether. Hence, they could do some good with what was left. And they will live to God for they come from a good stock. Consequently, they have been trimmed a little and placed in the building of the tower. However, the other stones that still remain spherical and were not fitted into the building, because they have not yet received the seal, were put back into their original place, for it turned out that they were round. This world and its empty riches have to be cut away from them then they will dwell in the kingdom of God. 
They must enter the kingdom of God because God has blessed this innocent kind. Not a single one of this group will perish. 4. Though one or the other may sin because of the devil's temptation, he will quickly return to his Lord. I, the angel of repentance, consider all of you happy, you who are innocent as infants, because your part is good and is honorable in the sight of God. To all of you who have received the seal, I make this declaration. Retain your guilelessness. Do not recall injuries. Do not persist in your wickedness or in the bitter memory of your past offenses. Be of one spirit and heal those evil dissensions. Remove them from your midst so that the Lord of the flock may rejoice in his sheep. And he will if he finds all the sheep in good health. But woe to the shepherds if he finds any of the sheep scattered. And if the shepherds themselves are scattered, how will they answer for their flocks? They cannot say that they were in distress because of the flock. They will not be believed, because it is incredible that a shepherd should suffer at the hands of the flock. His punishment will be all the greater because of his falsehood. I also am a shepherd, and I am under a most stringent obligation to give an account for you. Therefore, mend your ways while the tower is still being built. The Lord has his dwelling among those who love peace, for the Lord prizes peace. But he is far from the quarrelsome and from those who are given up to wickedness. Give back to him the spirit as whole as you received it. Suppose you give a new garment to the dyer whole. You want to get it back whole. Will you take it if the dyer returns it torn? You will instantly become annoyed and pursue him forcefully, saying, I gave you a whole garment. Why did you tear it and make it useless? Because of the rent you made in it, it cannot be used. Surely you will say all this to the dyer for the rent he made in your garment. Therefore, if you are so annoyed about your garment, and complain about not receiving it whole, what do you think the Lord will do to you? He gave you his spirit whole, but you return it to him altogether useless so that it cannot be put to use. For it began to be unprofitable as soon as it had been spoiled by you. Surely the Lord of this spirit will punish you with death for this deed of yours. Evidently, he will punish all those he finds continuing to bear malice, I said. Do not trample his mercy, he said. Pay honor to him for his patience with your offenses. He is not like you. Therefore repent, for that is useful for you. All that is written above, I, the shepherd, the angel of repentance, manifested and spoke to the servants of God. Therefore, if you believe and hear my words and walk according to them, correcting your ways, you can live. But if you persist in wickedness and continue to bear malice, remember, no one of this type will live to God. All that I had to say has been told to you. The shepherd, in person, also had this to say to me. Have you asked all your questions? Yes, sir, I said. Why then did you not ask me about the marks left by the stones put back in the building? We filled up the marks. I said, I forgot, sir. I shall tell you about this now. They are those who have heard my commandments in the present time and have repented with their whole heart. After the Lord saw how sound and thorough their repentance was, and that they were able to remain in it, He ordered their former sins to be wiped out. These marks are their sins which have been leveled off so that they might not show. Chapter 33 
The Tenth Parable After I had written this book, the angel who had handed me over to the shepherd came to the house where I was and sat on my bed. The shepherd stood on the right. Then he called me and said, I handed you over with your household to this shepherd so you could be protected by him. Yes, sir, I said. So if you want protection from all annoyance and cruelty, if you want success in every good work and in every word, if you want power of righteousness, walk in the commandments of this shepherd and the commandments I gave you. With them, you can overcome all iniquity. For if you keep the commandments of this shepherd, all the lusts and pleasures of this world will be under your control, and success will follow you in every good undertaking of yours. Imitate his self-restraint and modesty, and let everyone know that he is highly regarded, and that his dignity is great in the sight of the Lord. Likewise, tell everyone that he is a ruler of great authority and powerful in his office. Over the whole earth, authority over repentance has been put in his hands exclusively. Surely you see that he is powerful. However, you make little of the restraint and modesty he shows you. I said to him, Ask him, sir, whether I have done anything against his command, anything offensive to him since he came to my house. I also know that you have not done and are going to do nothing against his command. He said, For your perseverance I speak. He has given me good report about you. Tell this to others. Those who repent or who are going to repent should have the same sentiments as you. Then he will give a good report of them to me and I to the Lord. Sir, I said, I also make known to everyone the glories of the Lord. It is my hope that all who committed sin in the past will readily repent upon hearing this, and thus recover life. Then continue in this ministry and fulfill its requirements. He said, All who fulfill his commandments will have life. Yes, such a person will be held in high esteem before the Lord. Anyone who does not keep his commandments runs away from his own life and despises him. But they have their own honor with the Lord. Therefore, all who despise him and do not keep his commandments deliver themselves to death. They are guilty of their own blood. I tell you, keep his commandments and you will have a cure for sin. Moreover, I sent these virgins to live with you because I saw that they were friendly to you. Therefore, you have them as helpers so that you may better keep his commandments. For the observance of these commandments is impossible without these virgins. Though I see they are glad to be with you, I shall nevertheless bid them not to leave your house at all. As for you, purify your house thoroughly, for they will delight to live in a pure dwelling. They are pure chaste and industrious, and are highly regarded by God, all of them. Therefore, if they find your house pure, they will stay with you. On the other hand, if the slightest taint creeps in, they will instantly depart from your house, for these virgins have not the slightest love for any taint whatever. I said to him, Sir, I hope that I shall find favor with them, and that they will always be glad to live in my house. Just as he, to whom you have handed me over, has no complaint against me, so neither will they. He said to the shepherd, I am sure that the servant of God wishes to live, and will keep these commandments, and that he will make this a pure dwelling for these virgins. After saying this, he handed me over again to the shepherd, and called in the virgins. To them he said, Since I am sure that you are willing to dwell in this man's house, I entrust him to you and his household also, so do not withdraw at all from his house. They were delighted to hear these words of his. Then he said to me, Conduct yourself manfully in this office. 
Make known to every man the wonders of God, and you will find favor in this office. Thus, whoever walks in these commandments will live and will be happy in his life. But whosoever disregards them will not live and will be unhappy in his life. Tell everyone who is able to perform charitable acts not to lag in good works, and that this is helpful to them. Now I say that every man should be rescued from adversity. For a person who is in need and suffers adversities in his daily life is in great torment and deprivation. The person who rescues such a person from deprivation acquires great joy for himself. For the man who is harassed by this kind of adversity suffers the same torture and affliction as the man in prison. Indeed, many incapable of enduring such calamities lay violent hands on themselves. Therefore, the one who knows the calamity of such a person and does not release him commits a serious sin and becomes guilty of that man's blood. Therefore, all of you who have received from the Lord perform works of charity lest while you are delaying the building of the tower will be finished and you will be rejected from the edifice. There is now no other tower being built. For on your account, the building of the tower has been interrupted. So if you do not make haste to do right, the tower will be finished and you will be excluded from it. After speaking to me, he got up from the bed and left, taking along the shepherd and virgins. However, he assured me that he would send the shepherd and the virgins back to my house.